It's time for Twit This Week at Tech. Jerry Pornell joins us. He's feeling much better after his stroke. We'll talk to him. We'll eulogize Leonard Nimoy with Jason Snell and Jason Heiner, all people with J's in the name. And, of course, the FCC decision, plus a report live from Mobile World Congress. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twit This Week in Tech, episode 499, recorded March 1st, 2015. Live long and prosper. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Audible.com. Sign up for the Platinum Plan and get two free books. Go to audible.com slash twit2. And don't forget to follow Audible on Twitter. User ID audible underscore com. And by shipstation.com. When you're selling online, getting your orders out the door quickly can be tough. ShipStation.com is the fast, easy way to manage and ship all your orders all in one place. For a free two-month trial, visit ShipStation.com, and before you do anything else, click the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in TWIT. ShipStation.com. And by NatureBox. NatureBox ships great-tasting snacks right to your door. Start snacking smarter with wholesome, delicious treats like chocolate hazelnut granola. Wow! To get your complimentary NatureBox sampler, visit naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. And by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Go to squarespace.com and enter the offer code TWIT at checkout to get 10% off. It's time for TWIT This Week in Tech, the show where we talk about the week's tech news. And holy cow, what a week it has been. But we have assembled such a great panel. Uh, I'm really thrilled about it, starting with uh, Jason Heiner of the Tech Republic. Hi, Jason. Hey, thrilled to be here, as Great ever. Uh, at Jason Heiner on the Twitter, CBS Interactive owns the Tech Republic. And your new yes, book is uh, is coming out chapter by chapter. I'm excited about this. We'll yes, give you, we'll give you a plug geeks. in a little bit. I, I we got so much to do. I don't, I'm going to have to monitor my time carefully here. Jason Snell is also here. So many Jasons. Yeah, Jason Howell running the board. Jason it's Snell Jason. from SixColors.com <laughs> at JS Hello. Snell, uh, former uh, executive editor editor uh, of uh, Mac World, PC World, IDG. He now does his own blog at SixColors.com. Right and some really good podcasts, including The Incomparable. And I'm thrilled to welcome Jerry Pornell back to our microphones. I don't need to s Hi. say much. Jerry Pornell, one of the great science fiction writers, uh, a man who inspired my own career with Chaos Manor, the column in Byte Magazine for many years. He's at jerrypornell.com. And Jerry, we'd heard around December your son tweeted that you'd had a stroke. Yeah, I had on the... 15th of December, I had a mild stroke, but as you can see, I'm pretty well recovered. Uh, I can stand up. I'm in a wheelchair, but I can stand up. I get around all right, and I talk now. I didn't at first. I was... Wow. Yeah, 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 oh, Jerry. Yeah, and that was horrible, but uh, I've got that back, too, and I've got two books going. Wow. Most of which are being actually, Niven and I are doing one with Steve Barnes. I do the plotting. They do the work. <laughs> I think plotting. And I've got another one, John Car uh, John, John DeChancey. Uh, same thing. I do the plot and they do the work. So the you're feeling fun. okay? You were fully recovered. I'm feeling very good. I don't walk without a walker, but otherwise you'd never know. I, I'm practically a can't walk without a walker, so I don't. And you, uh, and you had you had brain cancer, and you, you I had brain cancer in 2008. Jeez. And I survived that with, with 50,000 rads of radiation. I'm hoping I've kind of got over all the bad things <laughs> that can happen. <laughs> you're you're kind of uh, like Rasputin. They just can't kill you, Jerry. I'm so, and we're so so glad. Welcome back. It's great to have you. And one of the reasons I wanted you on, uh, we'll talk about the FCC's decision in just a bit. Before we get to that, of course, Mobile World Congress is going on right now. Some big announcements already this morning. Um, uh, before we get to that, 
Uh, we should probably mention that uh, Leonard Nimoy passed away uh, on Friday at the age of 83. In fact, his memorial service is going on, uh, I think, as we speak. William Shatner, Captain Kirk, uh, was uh, reporting that he wasn't going to be able to go. He had a prior commitment, a charity event that he, you know, really couldn't reasonably get out of uh, to go to Mr. Spock's funeral. But the good news, apparently, is that uh, Shatner was able to get on a plane. And so uh, he's going to be there. I know that it, it was... Oh, good. Yeah, he was memorializing uh, uh, Leonard Nimoy uh, on Twitter. Um, there was a, kind of a furor when he said he couldn't go. But, you know, once you understand it's a charity event. And I love this billboard. Could you zoom in on that billboard? This this billboard was put out up uh, in L.A., I think, I'm told, near Shatner's home. Is that right? I think and, it's a, uh, and it's one of these electronic billboards. I, I saw somebody who said they saw it in Atlanta, too. Oh, so maybe it's all over. And it's a picture, of course, of uh, Leonard Nimoy as Mr. Spock making the Vulcan live long and prosper sign. And we're all going to do that right now and, and think about M Mr. Spock. And I love the epitaph. He did. He did. Yeah. Sure. So. Thumb out. Yeah. Yeah, an amazing fellow and much beloved. Mm-hmm. And deservedly so. And I know uh, we were, Jerry and I were talking, because Jerry, you know Gene Roddenberry, or you knew Gene Roddenberry pretty well, I think. Yes, yes. As a sci-fi writer. And Gene and I were at a conference at the Smithsonian for a while, and then at the Library of Congress. But you didn't it know was a more. interesting conference. There were a couple of Nobel Prize winners. Uh, there was Sir Fred Hoyle. There was Gene Roddenberry, there was me, and there were 15 unpublished Washington poets. <laughs> and I asked the librarian, why 15 unpublished Washington poets? And he said, who do you think is paying for it? Their husbands do. <laughs> so these ladies sat in the back of the room, and uh, we sat at a conference table in the Cooley's Library, and we had a week-long conference on science fiction and literature. Uh, there are some really uh, beautiful tweets in Leonard uh, Nimoy's uh, uh, Twitter stream. His last tweet was uh, several years ago. One of the tweets, uh, I wish I hadn't smoked. Uh, he had quit smoking 30 years ago, but uh, passed away yeah. from COPD. You went. Yeah. Some of its effects. Is this What's right? The real Nimoy. Oh, the real Nimoy. No wonder. The real Nimoy. This is the fake Nimoy. Uh, who, ah, there we go. And uh, this actually features tweets from uh, other folks, I guess. Um, yeah, his last tweet was just earlier this week. Amazing. Really amazing. And then they've been retweeting various And, the, and the, the, the account is, retu is retweeting uh, memorialization. So um, just some really... Yeah, his last tweet was, A life is like a garden. Perfect moments can be had, but not preserved, except in memory. Live long and prosper. Wow. Okay, now I'm going to cry. Thanks a lot. He wins for cool. best last tweet ever, I think. You can holy close the books cow. On that Pretty one. prophetic. Oh, holy cow. Well, I think he knew he was uh, yeah. on his way out. Yeah. Uh, all right. Mm, let me dry my tears a little bit. Um, you didn't know uh, Nimoy, uh, Jerry. I never met him, actually. I don't think I did. He, we may have been at a, an agency party or something yeah. at the same time, but I never actually met him. Yeah. Well, there you go. What can you say? Mobile World Congress going on right now in Barcelona. Uh, we actually have two reporters there. Mike Elgin of TNT is there, and he'll be reporting uh, all week long uh, on TNT and TN2 from Barcelona. Miriam Schwar is there as well. Uh, things, ha the conference itself won't kick off till tomorrow, but things have already started in some ways. Huawei announced its first Android Wear watch, the first Android Wear watch with a sapphire crystal, the Talkband B2 activity tracker, and the N1 earbud hybrid. Acer announced the Liquid M220. Yes, a Windows phone on a budget which means it's not going to be a high-end Windows phone. Everybody's waiting to hear if there'll be anything at uh, Mobile World Congress like the uh, Nokia 1520s. Microsoft is there, but they've even said, I think we're not going to announce any new high-end Windows phones. And, of course, the, the other uh, two big companies that were most interested in, HTC and Samsung, both had events. Miriam Joir was at the uh, HTC event where they unveiled the HTC M9. She had this report. 
Hey there, it's Miriam Schwar with the Twit Network, and this is the HTC M9 here at Mobile World Congress 2015. As you can tell, it's very much an evolution of the original HTC One M7 and M8. Uh, this particular device is actually an interesting uh, shade combination. The edges here are uh, gold with the back uh, being silver, which is uh, quite a nice color combination. Uh, so what's changed since last year? Uh, it's a, a same uh, beautiful display, a 5-inch uh, 1080p display with uh, Snapdragon 810 this year. And uh, the other thing you have to keep in mind is the camera has obviously changed quite a bit. There's a 20 megapixel autofocus camera now, with, instead of the 4 megapixel ultra pixel camera from the previous two models. However, the ultra pixel camera is now located in the front, up here, uh, as a selfie camera. So that's uh, one of the changes. And uh, finally, uh, everything else is more or less where you'd expect it to be for this phone. Uh, you get the same uh, SIM trays in the same places, buttons on the same places, micro SD card slot expansion, headphone jack, and micro USB, which is hidden here by this, uh, this uh, security attachment. But basically, that's the HTC One M9. Very much an evolution of last year's design. Three gigs of RAM, uh, 30 gigs of storage. Um, yep, that's it here at Mobile World Congress 2015 in Barcelona. Thank you, Cheers. Cheers. Uh, HTC, I guess, decided not to improve on what many consider the best uh, Android phone of the year. Certainly the best design, mm -hmm. although uh, they still have HTC Sense, yeah. HTC Blink. Um, Jason, you... You like this phone? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it's just, it's an evolution. I mean, they had the, it was probably the best design Android phone, um, as it were, in terms of, you know, really slick and, uh, uh, you know, wow factor. I think the thing uh, that kept a lot of people from buying it was the, the camera, frankly, the four megapixel mm -hmm. camera. That's just not, uh, that's a non-starter. And a 20 minute that megapixel proved that considerably. They also are doing yeah. what everybody's going to do, which is much better front-facing cameras. Originally, I think front-facing cameras are all about Skype. Now it's clear, selfie. They're the selfie cam, yeah. so they're doing. They're putting the ultra pixel on the front and a 20 megapixel on the back. That wasn't the only thing HTC announced. They also announced the Vive, which is uh, very much like an Oculus Rift. It's a Steam-focused yes. VR helmet. They're doing it with Valve. Um, is it? Is this going to be just for using with Steam or what? It'll be interesting because, you know, this VR stuff is, is I, I was pretty skeptical of it, you know, all, all around. But uh, this is really picking up Steam this year. So and to speak. Some interesting <laughs> they did pick up Steam, literally. Literally um, picking up Steam. Oh, sorry, bad pun. Um, you didn't even but, know but it, no, did you? They, <laughs> I didn't even know it. Yeah. Um, but, but they... Uh, but, but in terms of VR, you know, the platform itself, as a platform, it's picking up steam. Um, I'm hearing about all kinds of interesting business uses for this stuff right now. Um, a, a lot of it around Oculus Rift, uh, clearly, as a platform. And so it'll be interesting. You know, the platform is the is the interesting play with this. You know, can they do that through Steam? Maybe. Um, or, or is there kind of going to be something else that can kind of ride on top of that? But, you know, there, there are companies that are coming out with some really interesting stuff in the months ahead um, in, in terms of what they're doing with uh, business uses. Some of these are public. Some of them aren't. But things like Marriott letting you go and and use that to, to look at resorts, uh, for example, um, and, and actually get a, a full walkthrough, you know, of it um, is one. Toyota has has talked about doing some things, uh, have, has announced the things that they're doing with um, helping people, you know, drivers, uh, especially teen drivers, um, go through some scenarios uh, that can help them be safer drivers um, using um, using VR. And so there are some really interesting practical uses. And so I, I think these guys jumping into this game a, a little, you know, with with uh, with with the new product is, uh, you know, kind of justifies the fact that there's just a lot of great stuff happening in that space, and it's not just games. I feel like I'm more excited about uh, Microsoft's Hololens and augmented reality mm -hmm. than I am about virtual reality. Uh, it doesn't have the same issue with kind of seasickness, queasiness, and every time I put on the Oculus Rift, I feel like I'm <laughs> I need a cold compass compress. Um, and I also think it's a lot harder to create content 
in it for a virtual world than it is to do uh, what Microsoft's doing with the HoloLens. They will have the HoloLens, they say, this fall. I'm wondering Windows 10. And I wonder if that's going to maybe... I, I feel like that's going to end this whole infatuation with VR. To me, VR is like 3D. It's a gimmicky... What do you think? I think it's um, it depends on who you are. I think that you're not as excited about the possibilities for gaming. I mean, for gaming and maybe for some of these things that Jason Heiner was just talking about, where you need to be completely it's immersed. Immersive. And it's a completely different thing. Yeah, but it's hard to do How? immersive well. These aren't, yes, it is. They're not very high-res screens. There is latency, which makes is what makes you seasick. But I don't think it's an either or because the HoloLens, you know, that's that is overlay technology, and that's going to be for things that might be game related, but are also just other real world things. It's much more what people I think thought Google Glass was going to be, except right. it, it wasn't, <laughs> uh, where you can overlay, you know, internet information on what you're seeing, and and the VR stuff is just totally different. It's blocking out the real world entirely, right. and I, there may be a place for that. I I worry that there's some. Uh, we see an announcement like this, HTC announcement, and we think, oh, great, it's another Oculus Rift. I wonder if there's a really uh, a disparity in terms of the technology involved. That would be the danger as a consumer. You don't want to split you, it. You buy, if you buy the HTC and it turns out that it's kind of lower-grade tech and that Oculus is really the one that's got so much that they've invented that makes their product better, you're kind of in trouble. It could stall it. We just don't know. It could be like beta versus uh, VHS. It could be. Um, Jerry, have you you must have you know at SIGGRAPH for twenty years they've had various virtual reality devices. Are you a virtual reality buff, Jerry? Oh, well, I point out that twenty years is a million times better in technology, at least in current trends. Yeah, and a million times better than what we have now, basically. Is good enough. Is immersive. It? Exactly. I mean, yeah. the hollow deck from the TV shows is likely to be reality by that time. I'm hoping they have it soon, so uh, you and I can hang out without leaving our living rooms. Well, it's getting close <laughs> to that now, but yeah. even Skype is pretty good. Isn't compared this? I mean, to what we used to have. It's, it's true. Louis C.K. was right. We're sitting here wanting VR, and here I am. Uh, you're in LA. I'm. We're up in Northern California, and this is. And Jason's in Knoxville. Where's it? Where are you? I never Louisville. Louisville. <laughs> and I, I can never get that right. Yeah, one of these days. And uh, it's as if we're all sitting around a table. So in a way, we've got yeah. something kind of. We're, we're exactly. getting. Leo, it's like I'm actually here. I can't believe how real it's. Wow. I am that realistic. Wow, you feel real. I know. <laughs> I'm actually a Hololens. It's crazy. Uh, uh, HTC oh. all and also announced a. Uh, it, I feel like this is a little bit of a me too. They. You know, well, Galaxy uh, uh, VR, Galaxy Gear VR, you know, Samsung's got it. We got to have it. Uh, everybody's got a smart band, so we got to have one. HTC did a deal with Under Armour, and they announced the uh, first HTC wearable. Um, not an Android Wear smartwatch, but a GPS-enabled fitness tracker called The Grip. Grip's got a grip on uh, me, The Verge. Oh, no, we're going to have to look at an ad. I don't want to look at an ad. The Grip... Uh, it, Kind of reminiscent a little bit of uh, the Nike Wear, uh, Fuel Band, Fuel rather. Band, right. uh, and uh, yeah. and a little bit of the maybe the Microsoft uh, Band. It mm -hmm. looks big. It looks clunky. Multi-sport mode, finally, it says, can track activities from running to cycling. A lot of these devices really are just pedometers right. that can work with running and walking and not much more. Uh, but also, uh, Samsung had its Samsung Unpacked 2015 this morning, we got up early, did a live special covering the keynote. Uh, very nice keynote, considering Samsung's previous <laughs> amazingly bad efforts. Yeah. Uh, in fact, yeah. they even had two women do most of the presenting, which uh, was, uh, Samsung had been accused kind of of a tone-deaf um, uh, idea of women uh, in previous events. This mm -hmm. was much better. Uh, Miriam I Jouar took a look at the Galaxy uh, S6 uh, at the demo room after the keynote, and she had this report, Miriam. Hey there, it's Miriam with the Twit Network, and this here is the Galaxy S6 Edge here at Mobile Congress 2015. Yeah, it's Samsung's latest and greatest, and it is a very, very nice phone, I have to say. Uh, so here you can see uh, 
it's shiny in the back, some sort of uh, glass or plastic finish. And of course, this is the edge. So it has this uh, kind of curved edge display, as you can see here, uh, which is very unique. It's similar to what was on the Note Edge uh, last fall, but it doesn't actually have buttons on it. They're just using it as a, a way to keep this uh, really smooth, curved edge. It's very, very nice. So this is a quad HD display, 5.1 inches. Uh, this is very high res, same resolution as the Note 4, but on a smaller display. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the chassis is made of metal on the edges here. Um, so that's pretty cool. Very nicely done. And in the back is a uh, new improved camera. It has optical image stabilization and an f over 1.9 lens. You can also still see the uh, heart rate monitor that was present in last year's Galaxy S5 and is also available on the Note 4. So yeah, this is a powerhouse. Uh, inside you'll find uh, uh, Samsung's own Exynos processor. It's uh, quad core, uh, of course, three gigs of RAM, lots of storage, something like 3264. Uh, and uh, there's no micro SD card slot, no expansion, no removable battery this year. This is a very new thing for Samsung. They usually um, have removable batteries and micro SD as a selling point. You see the volume rocker up here, the uh, headphone jack. Actually, no, that's the infrared port. And uh, headphone jack's on the bottom, where the micro USB charger data port is that's obstructed by this uh, safety device here. Uh, home button, of course. So yeah, the Galaxy S6 Edge here at Mobile Congress. Really light, really nice phone. Cheers. That's, a, that's a saying a lot because Miriam is a big HTC fan and has been for some time. Uh, Galax, uh, Samsung announced two versions of the Galaxy, one that's got a, basically a flat screen like an existing Galaxy uh, phone, and the Edge, which is not like the current Edge. Uh, the current Edge is two screens, one curved and one flat, and they show different things. This one is one looks like one Super AMOLED screen that is curved around the front, Right, which I like better, frankly. It looks, it looks. Uh, people have seen it, including Miriam, say it looks gorgeous. It does have some of the capability of the current edge. You can have an edge display, but not nearly the not nearly the capabilities of the current edge, which is fine. I, I thought that was a, a mistake. Samsung did say no more removable battery, but we are going to have very high speed charging and will support both wireless standards, Qi and PowerMat, which is great news. I think. Um, uh, yeah, very cool. Yeah, no SD card, but uh, as Miriam said, 3264 and 128 gig versions. So that's probably better than having an SD card in most respects. Why uh, would it be better not well, to have a removable card? Uh, a removable card's great because you can take it out and maybe copy stuff to it and so forth, or you can have multiple cards. But on most platforms, this SD card isn't an equal to internal SD storage. And so having... Yeah. Internal store, large capacity internal storage uh, means you don't have to worry about where I'm storing apps. Most apps cannot be moved to the SD card. No app with a widget can be moved to the SD card. So having it all internal and having sufficient internal storage, I think, gives you most of the capability you'd want an SD card for. And put you at the mercy of the cloud. Well, 128 gigs, Jerry. I don't think you're going to need much cloud storage if you get a giant one uh -huh. like that. Uh, in fact, Maybe. that's as much storage as you're going to be able to put in. I guess you could put it, in a 128 gig SD card. But it does put you at the mercy of their pricing of that memory, which well, if it were, you know, a separate slot, you get that memory probably for a lot less a lot than less. what they're going to price it they at. They are using EM EMMC memory, which is uh, the same memory used, I think, in the solid state drives. It's a lot faster than the flash storage in existing phones. That's a big improvement. They, it looks like they've made massive improvements to the... Uh, the camera, including an F, as uh, Miriam said, F19, um, and the fingerprint reader is much more like Touch ID on Apple. The current fingerprint reader on the uh, S5, S5 and the uh, Note 4, you have to swipe. It's kind of like the laptop fingerprint readers, where you swipe yeah, your finger terrible. along it. Now it's just going to be like the Touch ID on Apple's, where you just put your finger on it. They also announced their own uh, uh, payment system, Samsung Pay. Which will, con I suppose, I don't know. I'm assuming continue to support the Touch to Pay technologies that uh, Android phones have now with Google Wallet, but also adds Loop Pay, a company Samsung acquired last month that lets you use a swipe card reader by not swiping your phone, but just putting your phone next to the swipe card reader. It puts out a magnetic field, which the swipe card reader 
misinterprets as an actual Jeez. magnetic strip. And uh, I know people have lose, used Loop Pay. Jeff Needles in our uh, office uses it, and he says it works quite well. So Samsung said at their event, we will, be, we will support m more payment terminals than anybody, including Apple Pay, because of this uh, acquisition of Loop Pay. And more ways to uh, better the system. <laughs> well, you know, and that's Andy Anako raised that question, he, and he'd like to see, and I, I would too, uh, if it's possible to maybe uh, snag that magnetic field <laughs> on its way to the stripe reader. But one good thing, Samsung's doing, just as Apple is doing, the same kind of tokenization. of There's no credit card transfer. It's a single-use uh, token that's passed to the merchant. The merchant doesn't get any information about you. Um, I think this is that's really good news. Uh, there, Apple Pay has clearly moved the market in uh, that respect. They're, so They're certainly getting there. I, you know, I mean, I'm excited. Uh, I feel like uh, Samsung has put together a very nice phone that, at least design-wise, looks a little bit... You pointed out it looks, looks a little bit looks, like an iPhone looks 6. Looks a lot like the iPhone 6. I think yeah. we talked about the HTC One, uh, which has been the go-to sort of like... Yeah, you want something iPhone, really nice yeah. like an iPhone that's got yeah. that high design and you want an Android phone, that was the go-to. And I look at the Galaxy S6 and I think, well... It might be the Galaxy S6. They got rid of that plastic back that was removable, which meant you could swap the battery and, and put it in like a card. And looked like a Band-Aid in some cases. And it sometimes looked like a Band-Aid yeah. or fake leather. Yeah. And now it's this Gorilla Glass back, and it's not removable. And it, it, it looks really nice. Actually, it looks like an iPhone 5 you're, you're, more you're, than an well, iPhone well, I think the Edge probably looks a little more like the 6. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. It, it, it looks good. It looks really good. Yeah, I, there's that, the rounded edge of both phones. I always thought that the, the for the leading Android phone, the Galaxy S models felt a little cheap because they had that. I agree plastic back they still have that physical home button but so does apple yeah uh and, and now that it's uh, you know it's a fingerprint reader so that gives it some justification for existence they're the only one of the few android devices that has still has physical buttons of uh on the front face of the phone well, i'm gonna definitely get the edge. Had less with touch small with phones but uh for some people and everybody's getting older the bigger the phone the better within within limits i mean it gets to the point you can't carry it but um uh, no, I they agree with you, Jerry. Small. The world seems... To, it's funny because Apple and everybody kind of mocked these. I remember when I started carrying a Galaxy Note 1, mm -hmm. which is smaller that. than the 5, the S6, rather. <laughs> uh, people mocked me. They said, what is it, a giant Hershey bar you're holding up to your ear? And and now it's just commonplace. I carry a Note 4, which I really like. That's 5 and 3 quarters inches. This is 5.1 yeah. inches. I don't... I. This phone will not feel big in, in anybody's hand, no. I predict. It's smaller than an iPhone 6 Plus. No. It's kind of stopped the momentum of these phones getting bigger and bigger, right? It's it's like, you know, with the, with this generation of Android devices, they are now sort of evening out and they're yeah. leaving some room for the phablet um, to, to sort of do its thing. I think the, S, the, the interesting thing, a couple of things, interesting things about the S6 is the one thing I like about the S5 and the other galaxies, because I've, I've had the last couple as my, um, as my work phone and I have an iPhone um, 6 as my personal phone, is uh, the... the um, galaxies bounce. I, I, I swear I drop that thing all the time. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just not as careful with it because it, but the nice thing about that plastic is it bounces and, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't crack as much. You don't need a case and that kind of thing. I worry especially about this edge and this thing's gonna is like got broken screen written all over it. Um, it's basically it, it, well, entirely made of glass. Yeah, the, the front, glass, the back, and the side. Like the iPhone 4. If, which everybody remembers was the, you know yeah. how your toast always lands butter side down? Well, it was both sides were buttered yeah. uh, because both sides yep. were glass, right? And that's what the case is here. Apple went away from that and went to a metal back to, so they could reduce right. the the breakage on the back of their phone. But the, the S6, definitely, you know, there's glass on the back. It's Gorilla Glass 4, the fourth generation Gorilla Glass, which they say is the hardest mm. glass out there. But glass is glass. It's, it's not going to be as impervious as that <laughs> hard plastic yeah. was. Actually, Samsung yeah. had some interesting uh, cases for this, including one that's somewhat translucent. Uh, we saw in a demo after the event uh, that looks pretty nice. Uh, I don't drop it. I predict there's going to be a lot more breaks with this thing, with yeah. the S6, especially the Edge. There's going to be a lot of breaks. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, I know that it, it looks great. I mean, there's. I think that I don't know why they made one with an Edge and without. The one with the Edge looks so much better. And it, it's sort of weird. It's not a feature you're going to really buy the phone for so i think that's sort of strange they should have just made one device if they want to go with this edge concept just do it and make that part of your design but um but that's not really their style but but i think that you know it's not as practical a phone but it looks a lot better um and it is an incremental upgrade again i mean it, they're doing all the right things as a fast follower that's kind of their game is to play fast follower 
And, you know, they play it better than anybody. And, you know, this does set them up to kind of reclaim some lost mojo. They've got a lot of um, competition coming from Huawei and um, Xiaomi, Xiaomi and um, and others, uh, you know, especially the Chinese manufacturers. Yeah, but they're still and, uh, not they selling in the U.S. It. Nobody, none of the Xiaomi or Huawei, that they're not selling in the U.S. They will be soon, though. I you mean, yeah, so? Huawei is in. Huawei is again, and um, I think it's only time. But also, this I is, love the know, me, the me, the new me is uh, me four yeah. is beautiful, and the me notes great. We just looked at the new Huawei. Miriam brought a few of those in, and some pretty nice stuff out there. But I think they can do they can do really well being everywhere but the U.S. too. I yeah. mean, you know, Samsung does well in the U.S., but they know U.S. is Apple owns the U.S. market more than ever. Is that fair? Um, I thought it was more like 50-50. Yeah, well, as a vendor, as a vendor, Apple's way out in front. You know, you, you compare them to all of Android, you know, it's it's a different story. But, you know, for, if you're if you're Samsung, you know, you, you especially care about Apple head to head. And, you know, Apple's selling a lot more devices than Samsung in the U.S. But worldwide, you know, Samsung is killing it. When I go outside the mm -hmm. U.S., you know, it's like Samsung is like what Apple is in the U.S. Like everybody's carrying Samsung, you know, and um uh, you know, especially in Asia and, and in Europe. And so I think those other brands and, and this will, I think, do well in those markets. Um, and, and but, but they're under seriously intense competition from some of those other vendors, especially the Chinese manufacturers. You know, they, they hear the footsteps coming w with those guys, even didn't if they're I, not. Didn't I just read that Apple still adds, takes like half of all profits made by all cell phones? Th that I'd believe. It's, way more, it's like, I think it's actually, the, the number just came out this week. We're above, we're like 70 to 80% yeah. of the profits. I wow. know it was Last high. quarter, it was, it was mostly Apple, high. a little Samsung. Right. And then ever, most of the other ones didn't even make money. But in the U.S., yeah. uh, Android's easily uh, beats Apple. It's got 61% of the market compared right. to 32%. Cumulatively. Uh, for iOS. Cumulatively. And now remember, Samsung's just a part of it, but Samsung's 27% of the U.S. market. Mm -hmm. So it's not that Apple is running away with this by any means. Um, they may be running Just away with the profits. Though. In fact, didn't Apple, isn't Apple now the biggest? It's maybe not running away, but it's sure walking fast. It's, it's, and it's <laughs> with a bag of money behind it. His pockets it, yeah. are stuffed with bills. <laughs> yeah. It is worth twice as much as Exxon now. Well, I mean, right now, cap, market cap. Apple and Samsung are the players in the yeah. smartphone world. That's well, and it. Samsung almost lost that with the S5. I think it was such a disappointment. Now, people are saying, well, what about the Note? The Note was announced at IFA in September of right. last year. So a Note 5 would presumably be announced in September of this year. So they're uh, they're off cycle with the Note and the uh, S6. I think the S6 looks good. I'm going to buy the Edge, and I just try not to drop it. The, the last <laughs> two um, Galaxy releases were kind of lackluster. Very I, I was lackluster. there at the S4, which was one of those embarrassing oh. uh, launch events, too. And, <laughs> you know, it, it, you felt like they were going to not mess with the hardware, and they were going to throw in a million different uh, features. And actually, one of the features of the S6 is that they reduced the number of features right. in the operating system. They actually are stripping out a lot of yeah. junk. No mention of things like the, the, the mo you know, turning pages with your eyes going <laughs> up and down. Or, yeah. You know, I can now <laughs> use the phone while my fingernails are drying and things like that. Uh, they left all of that out. And, uh, and by the way, announced no other products. The only product they announced at this event today was an updated Gear VR helmet that fits the Note 6. And oh. that's not much of a change. They decided to focus laser-like on the S6 and put their fortunes. And I think they needed to do that, frankly, because the S5 I was guess such a... I just old-fashioned. What do you, what do you the... use? Use an iPhone, don't you, Jerry? I use an iPhone. My son uses an S6, and uh, it likes it. Though I don't know, it's a, it's a big Samsung of some. Oh, the Note. He probably uses the Note larger. Four. Yeah, yeah. I'm was gonna go down and buy an i6 when I had the stroke, and I haven't got around to it. So I'm still got this old, um, this old. Jerry, iPhone. we need to send you a new phone. New iPhone. Holy but cow. Old Apple isn't going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll go buy one when I get a chance to get down to the Apple store. I think the uh, iPhone 6 is great. And by the way, there may be a reason to carry an iPhone. We'll talk about that in just mm -hmm. a second. I'll just quickly wrap up Mobile World Congress coverage. There were a couple of other announcements. Low-end phones are a very big part of the market. We don't talk about it because it doesn't have all those exciting new whizzy features. Yeah. But uh, the low-end phones are huge. Motorola uh, on Wednesday sent us a box 
with the second generation Motorola G, a very credible, very nice phone, much like the Moto X, but $150 out the door, unsubsidized. Mozilla has announced a flip phone and a slider phone. So if you miss your old flip phone, the, these are using the Mozilla operating system, which I don't, I'm not, the Firefox operating system is not my favorite in the world, but uh, these are, th there's a huge market for inexpensive phones, often with dual SIMs, FM radio features uh, that aren't usually uh, seen in the United States, and of course, supporting the, the wireless bands that are used around the world. Uh, this is probably where the most of the money is going to be made, or made, I'm sorry. I don't. I doubt there's much money to be made, but most of the sales yeah. are made. Yeah. I was going to say there isn't much profit in yeah. cheap phone. No, that's why Apple doesn't do one. Yeah. Yep. All right. We have an announcement from Apple coming up. We'll talk about that in just a second. Before we do, though, let's take a break and talk about Audible.com. I'm an audiobook fanatic. Since the esteemed Jerry Pornell is on with us, we should quickly point out that uh, Jerry and Larry have a number of books available uh, on Audible.com. Some of your, some of my favorites. In fact, I think I'm thinking that I'm, most of the books I've read of yours, uh, I've listened to on Audible. The Moat in God's Eye. You love. They you. are, they are selling very well. Good. We got a huge royalty check from Audible. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. So you don't, you don't mind people listening. I love it. <laughs> Good, because that's how I, I don't, I, I can barely read anymore. I have to listen. Uh, the Gripping Hand, that's the sequel to The Moton's Gods. I did, that one came out fairly recently. That's on audible.com. Footfall, Lucifer's Hammer, which if you haven't read, you I mean, you're just missing out. Plus a lot of others, High Justice, Janissaries. Uh, some of these are young adult uh, novels, which is uh, great. In fact, Audible's great for younger people. Your kids, your teenagers, often, and research shows this, they get into reading by listening. If they're not into reading yet, Get them an Audible book uh, and get them to listen. And research shows that kids who listen to books read more books as well. It gets them. It gets them going. Uh, it doesn't have just to be uh, you with a with a kid in your lap reading. That you can do it together though. And we do that actually with Michael. We've been listening to um, uh, the Lightning Thief, which is a great book for young adults, and he is loving it. Uh, and then uh, you know that gets him it gets him reading. Uh, in fact, Audible got me reading again. I've always loved reading, but you know, with with work and long commutes, um, I didn't have time to to sit down with a book very often. And as you get older, frankly, one page, I'm asleep. So, Audible's great in the car, at the gym, walking the dog, doing the dishes. We have Audible on in the house almost all the time, both fiction, nonfiction. Uh, let me tell you, if you if you haven't tried it yet, I've got two books for you, and that's pretty cool. If you go to audible.com slash twit and the number two, audible.com slash twit two, you'll be signing up for the platinum plan. That's uh, uh, two books a month. Your first month's free. Your first two books are free. You'll also get the daily digest of the New York Times of the Wall Street Journal for free. Cancel any time in that first day. You'll pay no first month. You'll pay nothing, but the books are yours to keep. I don't think you're going to cancel, but we understand. Maybe you've never listened to audiobooks you don't know. Audible.com slash Twit 2. Start with maybe a Pornell Niven classic. When I first joined yeah. Audible, they didn't... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry says, yeah. <laughs> when I first started um, listening to Audible, they were a little disappointing on sci-fi. And then they started the Audible Frontiers program where they actually record uh, sci-fi in their studios. A lot of books, Heinlein books and stuff that were never in audio... Uh, are for the first time available in audio, and it's really yes, and great. and they have very good actors and actresses reading them, too. They do. They go, they're they in uh, Newark. They get New York Broadway actors, some really great people. Christopher Hurt doing uh, Stranger in a Strange Land. Wow. Um, that would be something to listen to. In fact, I'm, I might have... Bronson Pichot doing Glory Road. Um, they. Uh, I got a good recommendation. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. What are you? What are you listening to? Yeah, I listened to this great one um, not too long ago, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Oh, um, great one. Isn't that a great story? The Gila. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes, the Gila cells. Um, and so, you know, her cells uh, were a major breakthrough. Her cancer cells were a major breakthrough um, in science, led to a number of major breakthroughs. And um, but there's also the story itself is is interesting and sad and, and, and you know, uh, Disturbing. There's, you know, it, there's uh, institutionalized racism. There's all kinds of interesting 
um, and, uh, you know, somewhat disturbing pieces. But uh, the story has a life of its own because her family sued you know, over, uh, you know, over this, uh, and because her cells, you know, she didn't necessarily know what they were going to do with their cells and agreed to it. And anyway, it's a, it's a fascinating, fascinating story. Um, and it's a, it's a great listen. The, the, um, the, there's almost a performance, um, in there at one point, uh, where, you know, there's some really, uh, amazing stuff that happens in the, and the voice actor, uh, basically goes from sort of reading it to kind of exclaiming, wow. um, and there's a great interview with uh with the author at the end that has some some great stuff uh there too so yeah great great listen it's not just somebody reading a book it really brings the book to life and it's it, it's it's mm. unless you've experienced it it's hard to understand how great audible is i know jason you're a big audible fan too mm -hmm. and uh i i tell you it's for me it's all i do now is I listen to audible books uh i just love it audible.com slash twit to get your first two free today Apple sent out invitations. You got one. I did. Damn your eyes. Uh, invitations to an event one week from tomorrow, March 9th. Um, Monday this time. Monday event. Is that unusual? They're usually yeah, Tuesday? Yeah, they've been mostly Tuesday, but they're moving it around now. This one's going to be at uh, Herba Buena Center, where they've traditionally had uh, their events. You know, it's, it's uh, six months to the day that they announced the Apple Watch. Six months to the day. Do you think that's significant or just... It may just be a coincidence, but I expect that we'll be hearing about the Apple Watch. So it's well, kind it of does. Funny. Okay, so the invitation... Uh, actually, this is not the invitation. This is just an image on oh, the invitation. That, yeah, that was... Yeah, below it, it said... Spring forward. Spring forward. And then please and come to our it is event. the day after uh, day, the return daylight of Daylight Savings Time. Savings time. Yeah. So you will be springing forward the day before. Um. Tim Cook has already said on his on his earnings call that April is the month. So this is not you won't ex I don't, we don't expect to get them on Monday. Yeah, I I'm not quite sure what to expect. I actually said on on a podcast that uh, I didn't think that they would do an event just devoted to the Apple Watch. Well, I was I think maybe totally wrong. Uh, it has been six months. They probably got a lot of details to report. They want to get people excited about the watch again in advance. It may be that this is when they also see the press with demo units. Um, that that could happen. Usually That's not they only unusual, give them. Is it? It's not unusual. It would be unusual if they give them to them, you know, three weeks before they ship. And if it ships in April, that would be uh, that yeah. would sort of be the timing. But uh, that that. Wouldn't surprise me if that's what they're doing too. And uh, since this this is a different kind of product because we already know that it exists, so they don't have to play as coy as they would with a product right. that was brand new. We we all know that this is, exists, and, and in fact, Apple employees wear them around. They, they and they're allowed to. The people who work at Apple who have an Apple Watch are allowed to wear it around. It's not a secret that they're wearing an Apple Watch. They just won't answer any questions about it when I you think ask them. Nick Bilton of the Times told us that there are one thousand Apple employees wearing watches now. I've seen them, and you know they're You've happy. Seen them? They're happy to. Say yeah, there, that's an they, Apple Watch. They just don't want to talk to you about it. I read an article it. that said they're putting it in a Samsung <laughs> that makes it look like a Samsung. I don't think watch. that's true anymore. I think that was when okay. they were working on them to uh, hide initially. Them. Now everybody knows that they're making a watch. Right. They know what it looks There's nothing like. To hide. They just won't tell you. You know, they're not going to give you a demo. They won't lift up their wrist and say, "Here, let me show you all the apps." That they're not allowed to do that. But it's out there. So to show that to the media and give members of the media uh, review units and. Uh, tell more of the story of the Apple Watch. Wouldn't surprise me if that's what most or all of that event is. It has to be. I mean, just Jason the fact that it says spring right forward. Back. That's such yeah, a time. No, it's a watch. Time, it yeah, yeah, exactly. Spring, spring forward's all about setting your clock yeah. forward. So. And that's, it's your Buena, Buena, yeah. where they usually do these big events. If you want prognostications on the Apple ecosystem, actually, Jason Snell's a person to follow. If you don't follow him on Twitter, do it. I've been following him for a long time and, uh, and talking to him. You know, we, we, we go back a long way. And I've asked him off the record on some of this stuff. Like, okay, what's really, what do you really think is going to happen, you know, coming up? So, and he's usually right. So, there you go. So, That's, what's awesome is that you got invited because you've left, nice you've left Macworld. Right. Well, they inv they invited me to the uh, to the event in October. And you'd already left? Yeah. So, so I'm, I, You're I stay in touch with You're just a blogger now, dude. I, I've got, well, you know, there are a bunch. They invite Jim Dalrymple. They invite Judd Gruber. Yeah. They invite a bunch of bloggers to it. Renee and, talking and Serenity are sort of Renee, essentially Renee, Richie and bloggers. Serenity call blogger going. We, we yeah. were... Talking before the show, and, and, and it really is Apple's relationship with you, not with your publication, that determines whether you get an invitation. I, I think there's something to that. I think that's not entirely yeah. it. Uh, I, I, I mean, we can go back. Who knows why? And, and I think the rules Unless are all changing. Unless you're at the Times or the Journal or something. Yeah. Yeah, I think in my case, I mean, I'm trying to start a site that is, that is covering Apple stuff. And they, yeah. they um, have been... 
you know, they I know them, they know me, and so being in their reviews program and getting you know getting a maybe review if someday I review, cover more Apple stuff, I could get an invitation. Do you think? Well, you know, if you put your mind to it and you work really hard, Leo, I, that's all right. I don't, we will be uh, <laughs> we'll be there. In fact, you can all be there because they're going to stream it uh, live starting 10 a.m. March 9th Pacific time. That's 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, 1800 UTC will be broadcasting live with our usual snarky coverage. We'll show the stream and then Andy and Akko and I and uh, Mike and whoever else happens to be around. Jason, if, oh no, you're going. I'll be there. Sorry. Show up. I'll be in the chat room. I'll send you some snark in the we'll chat. We'll put you in the holodeck and uh, let you experience <laughs> it through the Twit stream uh, on uh, a week from uh, Monday. What? Do, any pr any predictions? They'll, we know there's three models, two sizes of each. A sport model at three hundred forty nine dollars. That's the mm -hmm. only price Apple's announced. Are you getting paged by oh, Apple the, right now? The, uh, <laughs> Mr. Spock is calling me from beyond to be. Uh, to be uh, I think it's going to be a huge flop. I'll be honest. I think they'll sell a million in the first weekend, and then after that, I what? think that. Um, I, Are you kidding well, me? First week, first week or whatever. You think, think it's going to be a flop? Yeah. You and I are the only people that think that in the I world. Do, I, I Apple's apparently, think, according to supply chain, made more than five million. Some say even a lot more than five million. Yeah, I think they were actually down. That was downplaying it. Honestly, one of the um, analysts said that they were going to sell over twenty million, which Yikes. I think there's no way. There's no way they will sell over twenty million. Um, that's uh, either gar one of the one. Of the, I won't say because you know whatever. <laughs> but one of the analysts was saying they're going to sell over twenty million of these. And here's here's what I'm in the first it. year. In the first year, in okay. 2014 calendar year. I, oh, I know this, 2015. They, okay, so this year. Sorry, 2015. Um, and Apple, I think, releasing that information that they've made five million. I think that was their way of tamping down expectations mm. and saying, right. you know, because obviously they, I think they leaked that. Um, and I think that was their way of tamping down expectations for that whole 20 million business um, that you know some of the analysts were saying. Yep. So I think you know when when the iPad first came out, if we just compare it to the iPad which was a device that nobody really knew what they that they needed and what they were going to do with. And it went, it, everybody expected it to sell 5 million and it sold 15 in its first year. Wow. I think that sort of made sense because there, there are some things you could do with it. And, and uh, especially, well, it kids. was a full computer. A watch it is was. not under in any, by any means a full computer. It's it a was. second display for your phone. Yes. And I who see needs a no second display. display. Exactly. The people who should be getting excited about this, I don't see getting excited about it, and that's what worries me and makes me think that they are, there's yeah. no way they're going to sell 20 million. I kind um, of agree with you. On the other hand, betting against Apple has never done well for me. <laughs> not recently. Not not uh, in a long time. So I, you know, these guys seem to have the f glitter, gold dust, something. Well, they're they're bound to slip up eventually. Jason is totally right that when there are un I would say unexpected or unrealistic expectations out in the market. That's when you see a story that leaks. I think that says, "Well, that's a little yeah. bit much, right?" Just to because mm. you don't want you don't want unrealistic expectations. If you're Apple, you yeah. want to manage that. that I, I do think that the, this is not the watch that Apple wanted it to be. Uh, there, we saw the story in the Wall Street Journal again, probably leaked from Apple, but no, who knows? That said that they wanted to have more health sensors, but mm -hmm. for battery reasons, technology reasons, and FD, FDA reasons, uh, they couldn't put all those health monitors into it. And I think Tim Cook saying Apple's watch will replace your car keys is a great example of lowering expectations. It's like, okay. <laughs> huh? Because <laughs> I, you know, first of all, I don't even, I have a fob. Is that what he's talking about? And that wouldn't they have to make a deal with the car company before that would happen? And how many car companies have they made that deal with? And that's just, if this is the selling point, this isn't going to make it. Um, so, the, their biggest competition is not other smartwatches, which are all you know. Even these ones that have come out at MWC, they look nice. I mean, they look really yeah. great. I like but my you know, uh, Android Wear watch. I think it does. Exactly. Yeah, it's not yeah, more than a second screen, but I can talk to it just as I'll be able. But to But they do don't that compete, watch. at least uh, unless you consider it right, sort of second the secondarily. The, those right. watches work on Android. The Apple Watch works on right. Apple stuff. Almost no watch works on both, and if it does something like the Pebble, the APIs are so much richer on Android, and right. Apple's never going to let Pebble have access to what the Apple Watch has access to. So really, what this is about is how many iPhone users are there out there 
who are using the five and beyond because that's what it's compatible with. That's your, and how many that's your, of them want to buy this accessory, feeling that it right. will upgrade their iPhone experience? That's and your that's total real, market. So you're how it's big, a big is that market? market? It's a big market. I mean, they, you've seen the volume of iPhones yeah. that Apple has sold. They sold it, 175 uh, million this year. It's a lot. But, so it's a lot. But no, 75 and a half million. That's I'm a sorry. that's an expensive accessory. So In that's the question. So there it's are hundreds a big of millions. market, though. There are a lot of people who will want expensive accessories to Apple products. I'm not one of them. <laughs> there are <clears throat> much better ways of monitoring your health than to wear an Apple Watch. Oh yeah. Well, I think um, it's a. I think these all of these watches are just glorified pedometers and maybe a heart rate monitor. Although they're not, my experience has been very accurate. I think ten million. I've seen, for instance, I think it'll that. Still you think they sell 10 million in 2015? In 2015, I think they'll sell 10 million. And that would and be disappointing for Apple, not so disappointing for most people. I'll sell 10 million anything. And by the way, $349 is a starting point. What do you think the price points will be? Any ideas? Oh, uh, what's the stainless steel going to be? 700. Twice yeah. as much. And then the gold is going to be thousands. 15,000. Right? Yeah. What? Something 15,000? 10, 15, yeah. 20. Not yeah. six, is, not seven? Those, Just those the gold. Is, I mean, a, yeah, a gold Rolex will cost you 10 or 15, right? Exactly. Those luxury watches are all 10,000 or more. There's a fundamental the difference. Your Rolex is going to last years and you can give it to your kids. Right? Your Apple Watch. I've got my dad's Rolex, but it's possible agreed, that the Apple Watch edition will have some sort of trade-in something. they're going to have to if they uh, expect to sell it for that it, much. It's got a whole package, right? The box that it comes in is itself a charger. Um, I mean, it's going to be, it's like super valet version of the well, Apple Watch. Apple so has already have put a trade in. Uh, safes in their stores. They never had safes before, even though they, so those little computers are thousands of dollars. So that might lend credence to having maybe mm -hmm. a few $15,000 items in the store in the back. Yeah. Uh, they also might be putting in carpet because Johnny Ives said, well, I would never buy an Apple Watch without carpeting. <laughs> that sounds like a hint that the Apple stores are going to, so as soon as you see carpet, Maybe there'll be like a velvet rope, and then behind there's carpet. They're doing there, this March carpet. 9th. You think it'll be April 9th? I don't know. It can't I, be I, much later than that. I would look. My uh, if they say March 9th, my guess would always April be 1st. it'll be the the a week from the following Friday. So it right. would be the what is that the the 21st or something like that. But they said it would be April. Right. So maybe it's a little bit longer. I don't know. Jerry, what's the most you'd spend on a wristwatch? On a wristwatch? Yeah. I spend about seventy-five dollars on an aviator's watch from Japanese companies, and you've had that probably for years. I've had <laughs> some watches. Yeah, I, they usually typically last me about three years. I buy a a watch that's good to three atmospheres water pressure, and uh, and it tells the time pretty well. <laughs> it tells the time very well. <laughs> So they all do. It's Any only a quarter, no, actually no. less than a quarter of what the lowest price Apple Watch would be. Yeah, I think Apple's I, real I challenge is they've yet to show it. anything that this will do that is like, oh, I gotta have it, right? That's I, mean, I remember well, if I want to to monitor my health, I'll buy one of these gadgets from the kids that are making them now that do take take a blood sample. And not only do the sugar, but about ninety percent of the everything else that the, they do in uh, in labs. Right. You just put your finger in it, on go, and it connects to your computer, and there it goes. And it's a box about the size of my diabetes shooter sugar meter. This is they're they're not going to do that with Apple. And I can get it for a lot less than the Apple Watch. Right. Yeah, I, I've kind of said this before, but I'll, you know, I'll say it again. When they first announced the Apple, I would have been more, um, I would have been more excited about this if it was, if it was less of sort of an old school watch and more of there was some great concept art that a couple of people did on like a, a Nike Fuel Band with more of a like a longer display right. that had some, some interesting touch gestures and all of that kind of thing. I think something like that that broke the mold uh, a little bit would have been. Um, they would have sold a lot more. They probably would have, it probably had a lower price point. You know, it would have been like $199 or, or something like that. Here um, is for, a watch. Like Swatch, <laughs> Swatch has announced a smartwatch, the Touch Zero One for volleyball players. Yep. They're going to own the volleyball <laughs> player market <laughs> on this one. It's got an ice cream cone on the front. Yeah. It looks pretty cool. It's, uh, they're like out pebbling pebble with their, wow. their look there. I, you know, 
I, I think that this is a lesson that is worth applying to the Apple Watch too, which is, you know, Apple's not trying to reach everybody. They are trying to reach a portion of rich people volleyball who've already, players who've already bought the iPhone. We already know the right. iPhone is the hot in the high end smartphone market. Which one are you going to buy? And they do pretty well. Well, I really wish that the that stainless steel model was not going to be. Seven hundred. If I it know, was five hundred, or I don't know, it's going to be the I cheap want. one because I'm going to be cheap and I'm going to buy gonna the get cheap their sport, one. I think that's yeah. what. It, but I you like the look of the stainless one. It's. I think the yeah. Apple Watch is water resistant. Although Tim Cook, this is this is how uh, crazy Apple Kremlinology is right now. Tim Cook mentioned that he wears his Apple Watch in the shower, and they, that made everybody say, "Oh." Well, it may be more waterproof than previously understood to be. be okay, whatever. But it's, I would say water-resistant is the safe bet. Any, you any, can get it wet, but don't go diving Any with more it. battery news? The last week, yeah. Cook said it was going to last a day. Yeah, well, so Brian Chen in the New York Times, former Macworld editor, actually, um, proud, to, proud to say, he reported, he's got some good sources, and he reported what seemed to be maybe controlled leaks about the battery life, that uh, they're they're planning a mode that is an extreme low power mode that actually displays the time because I think they were all worried about this idea that it that basically the screen's off unless you jiggle it. Right, that's uh, how most that's Android really Wear UI, works. But to get to save like battery life, yeah. to save battery life, they, you know, a lot of watches do that. Right. Um, so it sounds to me like they're still targeting, you know, you can use it for a whole day and a that watch. you'll be able to see it. So we'll see. But I, it seems to be that Apple's trying to express that they are going to hit their battery life goals. We'll see. They're not the only ones. Swatch announced a new one. And uh, Philippe Kahn's uh, company uh, that does the Motion X uh, um, accelerometers that are in many of the uh, fitness bands has announced a partnership with luxury switch, swish, swish march makers, Mondaine, Alpina, and Frederic Constant. Oh, they're very good. They're ho this is a horological <laughs> smartwatch. Mm. Make your oh, own joke what? there. Um, and these will be, uh, they'll look just like the quartz watch they've been making for a long time. Battery life of two years, but the abitness to track, ability, what's wrong with my, the abitness? <laughs> they'll have the abitness to track your fitness. They'll, uh, like Jawbone or Fitbit, fitness trackers, that's because of Philippe's company. Uh, the company Full Power, Philippe Kahn, who uh, is a character, said, you, I'm sure Jerry has some great stories about him. Said, there's a group of people that'll buy anything. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that sounds like Philippe. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's a way to announce a smartwatch. It'll cost thousands of dollars. Um, so there you go. And uh, that's that's hey. that's not all. Pebble has announced its newest uh, color uh, watch. They call it uh, color, what do they call it? Color Pebble time. screen time. Pebble time. And they're oh. using Kickstarter again. Oh, I got to see. I got to see Leo, what they're up to. I wonder up, how up, many up. of our listeners are likely to be worried about Apple watches. Well, that's a good question. I don't know. $11.8 million so far. Okay, so this is crazy. So uh, you remember that the first Pebble watch was one of the very earliest Kickstarter successes, mm -hmm. raised oh, $5 yeah. million dollars. Yeah. Uh, it blew everybody away in a month. Uh, that created the Pebble Watch. <laughs> Four days in, no, five days in, they were looking for half a million. They've got 11.7 .7 million. Mm -hmm. What the hell? Oh, this, to me, I, I shows that Kickstarter is now basically a pre-ordering service because... It's, you're not. It's not. You're not like investing it or fostering a new innovation. You're just saying, "Hey, I, I got to get that watch." And it's. Uh, let's put this in perspective. It's about sixty thousand watches that they've sold, which is nice for them. That's, That's really good. good for them. Sixty thousand. They claim a million total of the original Pebble. So, yeah. yeah well, they, they've been selling that for two and a half years now. Yeah. I mean, I've had a Pebble for two years. Would you want Kickstarter this? Kickstarter was delayed. Uh, you know. It's what I said before. I like my Pebble, and uh, I've enjoyed my two years with it. But as an iPhone <laughs> user, they are really limited in what they can yeah. do because Apple, yeah. all Everyone watch them. features Apple is putting into the iPhone are geared toward the yeah. Apple Watch. And if I'm going to use an iPhone I, and I want a smartwatch, I'm going to need the Apple Watch. If I'm using Android, I think it's really compelling because it's not one of these last for a day color screen kind of, or, you know, backlit LCD screen kind of deals. This is their e or what is it? E-paper. E it's e not e-ink. It's e-paper. Yeah. It's like, it's like a, a, an LCD screen, color LCD. And it lasts a week. 
And it does use some of the Android Wear APIs, so it does have good integration with Android. And I think it's compelling, and it's cheap. It's not, you know, it's not a super expensive model. So yeah. it's yeah. it's kind of compelling. I wanted to see somebody put this image of the watch side by side with an Apple Watch when it comes out. <laughs> and just, yeah. I mean, gold, come put, on. Put it next to the gold one just Apple, for kicks. Apple yeah. will sell more in one month than, than Pebble has sold in its whole lifetime. And I'm a skeptic of the Apple Watch, obviously, right. but Apple will sell more in one month than, than Pebble sold sure. the whole time. But Mijikowski, I, I sat next to um, Eric Mijikowski, the uh, CEO of um, and kind of founder of, of Pebble at CES at a dinner last year. And he said something so compelling, I thought, which is we're not competing with, um, uh, you know, other smartwatch makers, really. You know, there, there are there are people who are going to like our product there. You know, we, we do certain things well. Other products, you know, do their thing. He said we're competing with people who don't want to wear watches anymore. Um, and I think that's still the case, and it's going to be the case for Apple Watch just as much yep. as it is for Pebble and others. It's competing with the fact that, all, that fewer and fewer people are wearing watches because, you know, it's one thing that you can get rid of with your another thing with your smartphone mm -hmm. um, that, you, you know, you don't have to, to have. You know, the smartphone is, has consolidated so many different devices, so many different things, the functions of so many different tools, and, um, and, and the watch is one of them. And so putting, getting people to put a watch back on is probably unlikely, but kind of like what, what Jason was saying, Jason Snow was saying was that what, what they're really going after and where, you know, they're, they're making a bet is that of those sort of, you know, almost 200 million people that, that bought an iPhone last year, that's going to be compatible with this thing, um, that uh, a pretty high percentage of them, all they need is, you know, 5% of them uh, you know, ten percent, five to ten percent of them who already do wear watches and want to have a smartwatch and are willing to, you know, shell out money for an accessory, and they've got a great market. You know, you're. I think you're totally right that the number one co competitor for every smartwatch is not wearing a watch. That, that is number one. Number two yeah. is maybe the competition, but number one is I don't want to wear a watch. Right. What I will say is I, I totally get watch skepticism. At the same time, there was a time when people carried watches in their pockets, and then. <laughs> they started strapping them on their wrists, and pocket watches went away because people thought it was more convenient to look at something on their wrist. That could happen again. That could totally happen. I'm not saying it will, but it could. There let, are some advantages on to glancing on your wrist instead of pulling something well, out of your let pocket. Let me point out that your real competition is with people like me who don't want to take the damn thing off at night. Yeah. Or when they take a shower, or when they go swimming, or take a bath, who just want to put it on and leave it there, yeah. and have it tattooed on, if I knew how to do it and <laughs> give it keep. Time. Now that's a business. Maybe the subdermal Ooh, wash. You could I like with that. the pebble. You could wear it for a week, uh, and shower with it and everything, and and it would still work. You just every now and then you'd need to be near an outlet once a week for a couple hours <laughs> to plug it in. Yeah. But you could keep it on while you did that. If they put a Tamagotchi. In my Apple Watch, I'm buying. I want a <laughs> virtual pen. That'll be an app. Maybe they have It'll an e-paper e on your wrist. Maybe they have e-paper on your wrist, and it could be like that that um, Motorola thing concepts, where you like swallow right? a pill, and yeah. like that power. Mm -hmm. We've seen concepts. Where oh, you those have... those tattoo displays. Any, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is there any chance that the Apple Watch will let you talk to Siri without taking the phone out? Yes. Of your pocket. Yeah, it's got a microphone on it, and you can actually just raise it to your raise your wrist Siri, up and say, "Hey Siri, whatever." Oh, oh geez, I just, I just set off everybody's right. iPhone. Sorry about that. Now, if if it actually lets you talk to your phone without taking the phone out and holding it yeah. in your hand, yeah, yeah. Uh, then there starts being some practical reasons to have it. I can do I that mean, with, uh, with the Android Wear watch. watch. When I get a text, says, I can hey, respond. Hey Siri, would you this, that, and the mm -hmm. other? Right. But the Android Wear watches do that. Yeah. You, it has a limited subset of commands. Yeah. But you and can Pebble do Time will do that, Google too. Pebble it. Time's got a microphone yeah. that'll work with Android. Um, I, I do sometimes. Actually, that's one useful thing. I'll get a text. I'll feel a buzz. I can read it, and then I can swipe right, and I can speak my response. Mm. And I do that at least once a day. Mm -hmm. Not that that's something I would go out and spend a lot of money on. I think there is a possibility that what these smartwatches will do is reduce our need to pull our phones out of our pocket and do Ooh, this for a thank while. God. And yeah. that might not be bad. If you were like glance, flip, and then you move on to the next thing, maybe that would be a good thing. That is such, an, uh, such a if burden. if they've got a decent speech to text, uh, well, speech to command language uh, capability. Well, we were talking about the Amazon Echo, which uh, you, you and I have both ordered it, Jerry, which is that little black tube that sits in your, mm -hmm. in your room. And, yeah. Um, 
you know what? Uh, there's something compelling about this, maybe because of years of sci-fi and HAL 9000 and all that, but I just like the idea of a little plastic pal that's fun to be with. I want to be able to talk to my, <laughs> my little friend and ask him questions. Nice reference. <laughs> We're going to take a break. We'll come back. There is a lot more to talk about, including a landmark decision from the FCC. That's why Jerry is here mm. to school yeah. us all and why this is a bad idea. Before we do that, though, let's talk about a brand new sponsor. We're welcoming ShipStation to the Twit Network. I first found out about ShipStation when I used it on Squarespace. This is so cool. If you do fulfillment, if you ship things, ShipStation.com. It could take your orders from eBay, from Amazon, from Etsy, more than 50 popular marketplaces and shopping carts. Easily create shipping labels for all the top carriers. You see them uh, right there, UPS, FedEx, of course, the Postal Service. You'll get a free U.S. Postal Service account that gives you access to deeply discounted shipping rates. The same rates that in the past only Fortune 500 companies have been able to get. ShipStation.com, it is the number one choice of online sellers, and they have an incredible 98% customer satisfaction uh, rating. If you do fulfillment, even international shipping with DHL, you'll get the best prices, best service, it couldn't be easier. I mean, it's completely automated. And right now, and I really want you to take advantage of this, you can try it for free for 30 days and get an additional 30 days when you use the offer code TWIT. 60 days total. Go to ShipStation.com. Before you do anything else, click the microphone. It's a little tiny one right at the top of the page there. A little tiny, little itty-bitty microphone. And uh, do enter in TWIT is the offer code. And you'll turn that free 30-day trial into a 60-day trial. And you will love it. ShipStation.com. We, uh, we really like technology companies that make life easier. And this is one. If you do any shipping at all, you must use ShipStation.com. Uh, okay. Uh, we came in. Uh, actually, was just here by chance. Uh... Was it Wednesday morning? Tuesday? Thursday. Yeah, it was my day off. I happened to be here. Just to, just, I was doing a thing on, on Marketplace. And by the way, if you haven't heard of the Marketplace Tech, it was fun. They do a number thing. We have a little contest. Uh, I did that on, on Thursday for Friday's air, and I happened to be here. And then I noticed that the chat room was talking about the FCC. They were streaming the hearing live for one of the most important votes, actually two of the most important, important votes, the FCC has ever made. A little history on this. Um, the chairman of the FCC, Tom Wheeler, who John Oliver called a dingo mm. because he said uh, letting Tom Wheeler watch over the internet is like letting a dingo watch your baby. Uh, Tom Wheeler, former Hall of Famer. No, actually still a Hall of Famer for the National Cable Association, for the Wireless Association, a lobbyist uh, appointed by uh, Barack Obama to be chairman of the FCC had attempted, uh, as his, his predecessor had, Julius Janikowski, to create open Internet rules. Verizon sued. The FCC was thwarted. The judges uh, in that case said, well, look, and this is well known, the FCC can only do what Congress tells it it has the power to do. It has to have a congressional mandate. The uh, FCC said, you know what, Verizon's, or the court said, you know what, Verizon's right. You can't promulgate open Internet rules. You have no, you have no jurisdiction. But the court did an interesting thing. Sometimes they do this. They gave him a hint. They said, now, were you to invoke the Telecommunications Act and declare uh, broadband providers to be telecommunications companies instead of information services, as you have declared them, you would have standing. You would have jurisdiction. You could tell them what to do. FCC uh, put on its thinking cap. Tom Wheeler uh, asked for comments, got 4 million comments, swapping, swamping the FCC.gov site, the vast majority of those comments coming partly because of John Oliver's piece mm -hmm. on uh, This Week Tonight, but also EFF and Epic and many of the other organizations. They got a brief from many big tech companies, um, all of them promoting this use of the Telecommunications Act and Title II of the Telecom Act to uh, declare that uh, broadband companies were telecommunications providers. We had a debate. We had two ISPs, one, uh, Dane Jasper from Sonic.net, who said, I, for one, welcome Title II regulation. Another uh, uh, small uh, ISP from Laramie, Wyoming, Brett Glass, uh, who said, oh, my God, you don't want that. Glass has already tweeted 
I'm going to sue. The AT&T has said, I'm going to sue because on Thursday, the FCC voted along party lines three to two to adopt Title II regulation. They declared uh, broadband companies to be telecommunications companies. They say, we have a 300-page document. One of these days, we're going to show you. That we'll, we'll let you read it someday. <laughs> someday, yes. we'll let you read it. That will be the mm -hmm. rules. They had a second vote, which I think was in some ways equally important and maybe shows that their hearts are in the right place. Uh, saying that they were going to restrict the abilities of state legislatures to prevent municipal uh, internet access. Towns like Chattanooga have really done a great job of providing gigabit uh, internet access to their residents. Uh, 20 state legislatures at the behest uh, and lo under the lobbying of the telecom, telecom companies have, uh, have made laws prohibiting that. Uh, the FCC says we're going to overturn, we're going to, we're going to re-regulate those out of existence and we're going to give because I think we all agree, Jerry, you, I'm sure, agree the best way to solve this is with real competition. It's just something we don't have right now. There are only, for 86% of the Americans, two choices, your phone company or your cable company for high-speed Internet. But at least that's two choices. Well, it's more right than one. now, with Title II, <clears throat> the, um, the, you understand Title II is a 1920, <clears throat> excuse me, it was it's written before you were born. Act. That's how old it is, ladies and gentlemen. From from copper telephone days when copper was expensive to, to run. Now, it gives them a right to, among other things, uh, uh, forbid content. Well, why do you, it used to be there's a federal crime about cursing over the telephone. They don't enforce it anymore. They've said... Well, we have all these rights now to regulate and to set prices and to license websites. Well, you they have said have that, that we would have the power to do that. Go to the FCC. They've said they no. will not inf they they will use forbearance. They are saying we will not do that. Right. You understand we won't do it. We just have the power to do it. Isn't that nice? Now... One thing I can assure you, regulators like to regulate. And <laughs> if they can regulate something, they will regulate something. Now, exactly what problem is this giving them title to? If Would you want Ma Bell back again to run the Internet? Well, because isn't that what we what have? Got now. Right. We have Ma Bell and Comcast running the Internet, Jerry. And by the way, they are solving a problem. Comcast and Verizon put the screws to Netflix, saying if you would like to reach our customers, you're going to have to give us more money. Yes, or but you look. If I <coughs> excuse me, if I do nothing but download movies all day, and you do nothing but just ordinary television communication with people should we pay the same rate this is one of the things that i i um ben thompson who's been on this show from stratechery yep. said is is he he likes this ruling but he says it will lead to metered access where yes. you pay for more bandwidth which is probably the right thing to do but that's what where this will probably lead what you don't want though is a cable-like situation where and I think this, see, my feeling is that Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, quite rightly, are acting as a business. They're attempting to maximize profit for their shareholders. And, of course, the best way to do that would be to charge for access to Internet providers. People like Twit, we are a content creator. Um, I can see them coming to me and saying, you know, our customers are watching a lot of Twit. You better start paying us if you want a decent performance. Uh, this would prevent that. Now, maybe we will have to change how we think about pricing. Leo, the president of AT&T, a long time ago, said that you're using my pipes and they're going to have to pay for doing it. But he didn't do it because competition kept him from doing it. The way to accomplish what you want out of Internet neutrality is to have competition. But what you've given is the right of censorship. But you agree we don't have competition, right? We don't have as much as we'd like, but on the other hand, 10 years ago, we didn't have any. 
I don't see yeah. much competition you right are now. Right in the if eighty six percent of, of Americans have two choices, both of which are big companies, their cable company and their phone company, who have already shown that they're uh, predisposed to you know squeeze them for as much as they can get. I don't think that's a competition. Now, I agree. I think we all agree that fostering competition is a good thing. And that was the Let second vote. Something. I think that's a uh, good thing. Adam Smith said in, in the Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith's first book, there never was a time when two capitalists sat down to have tea, but that the conversation turned to how to make government restrict competition with them. Right. He didn't put it quite that way, but that's what he said. Do you really believe that you, as, a, as opposed to a lobbyist for Comcast, will have more influence over the, a, of the FCC when it's all done? I think there's evidence that we did. I think Tom Wheeler, who is, in fact, a, was for a long time a lobbyist for both wireless and cable, probably didn't want to do this, but received four million comments. And I think those four million comments swayed the president who does have to get elected it does appoint the chairman of the fcc and ultimately i think the president swayed the chairman of the fcc to listen to the people so i do think we have a lot of power in fact in this regard ultimately we elect them or unelect them and as long as people care the citizens of the internet care about internet access the bet we have no sway with comcast we have no sway with at&t there's no question about that uh, it's supposed to be a government by the people for the people, and I think we ought to act as if it is. And and we do need There's to regulate. You, you, you would agree that some regulation is necessary. You'd agree that antitrust laws, for instance, are necessary. I would love the antitrust laws, but now, for instance, the con in the first place, you understand the Congress, as soon as it gets past the, the veto power of Obama, is going to take all this away. The Congress has made it very clear they did not intend for Title II to connect to uh, apply to the Internet. The Internet grew by having essentially no regulation or damn little. So you're, you're dealing with a temporary situation, and in fact, by the time it can be implemented, it probably won't have won't, it will have changed the administration. Well, and the courts so are obviously. Sense, uh, we know that AT and T's already filed a brief to sue, so it's going to. Well, the lawsuits in one will sense, happen this as well. is a, 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 a moot point because by the time this stuff gets to the courts, we'll have had another big election, and you'll find out right. whether your four million comments were really comments from people who just suddenly spontaneously sent them. Or they were kind of curried by the people who wanted that kind of content. I think that I, don't I just think we'll think, think Congress ahead, intended, for instance, for Chattanooga not to be able to provide wireless to its people. They actually provide fiber. Um, yeah. And, you know, the yeah. minute the, the city of Philadelphia uh, inaugurated municipal Wi Fi, Verizon went to the Pennsylvania state legislature and made made them knock it off, and yep. uh, that's happened in twenty states. Um, now, I, but I think that you're FCC. right. If people don't, if people say government sucks, regulations suck, we have nothing to do with it. If they take the cynical route, you're right. But I think this is a case where uh, people are starting to realize the citizens of the internet care an awful lot about this stuff, and I, I think, think we are too. voters and we are going to vote this. Well, I agree. I think I we're still going to be talking about this in 20 years. If you too. give government power, it will use it. Yeah, I and think, you know, this is an ideological discussion. You and I differ on uh, our uh, views of government, and uh, and and that's always going to happen. No, I mean they'll use it for what they think is good. Yeah, but we, what we differ on that. But I don't think. But that's an ideological or a political good. discussion, uh, and I think that there's a very clear path here that that we need to follow, or we are not going to get the internet uh, we deserve. Jason, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think that in one sense, I, I would, we, we were talking about this, we've talked about this a lot, obviously, you know, in our And newsroom. on this show and you and I'm sure everybody yeah. has, yeah. Uh, to, um, and, and, and I've noticed that more and more users kind of tune out a little bit. And I think that one of the reasons they do is they expect, and I think they're right, is that we're still going to be talking about this in 10 years. We may still be talking about it in 20 years because if... We agree that, as it now is, that the that the internet is a um, vehicle of public good. 
and it is. And there are now services, goods and services, but especially in government services and other things that you cannot access unless you have a decent connection um, to the Internet or cannot access as well or research or anyway. All of those things are true. And the Internet is a, a function of public good. And the question now is if that um, vehicle of public good is in the hands of private companies in a society, in a capitalist society like ours, there is going to be a natural tension over to what they should do and what they can do, what they can't do, and what we want them to do. And so I've, as long as that is the case, um, as long as, you know, this vehicle of the public good is in the hands of these private um, capitalistic companies, then, and, you know, the people have an idea of what they, you know, this trust that they've, that they're giving them to something that is now integral to the lives of everyday people to, to live their lives and to do many of the things that they need to do. You know, we're going to be having this debate indefinitely. Well, I think, it, yeah, I mean, and I understand the fear, uh, I think everybody shares, of uh, government run amok and regulating the Internet out of existence or limiting the kinds of content or charging license fees to people like me. And th that would be a bad thing. Uh, I, if you think if you think that's going to happen, then I can understand your concern. But at the same time, I mean, I, I'm concerned that the a lack of net neutrality eliminates competition in innovation on the, on the internet, right? That's this this company, my company, would not exist yeah. if the internet did not allow anybody to use it freely. Well, and let's say you make a deal with Comcast, and then there's a great competitor the coming up guy, that wants to take right. to eat your lunch. The incomparable has yeah, not a, has no right. shot at all. I, 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 you've got the deals. I can't. I can't win right. there. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's bad. Yep. All right. Any uh, final th uh, Jerry? We're going to give you the final word. There never were two capitalists sat down to have tea, but what they discussed, how to get government to eliminate competition. Not not between them. They'll live without, but newcomers, oh, we don't need those. This is really giving the government the power to decide who can compete. Now, if that's a good idea, fine. The best, best way, easiest way to do it, of course, is to license website. I don't think I think that's a non-starter. I don't think that's ever going to happen. But let me ask you what you would prefer. They have the power now. They have the power. It's never going to happen. What would they prefer? What would you prefer? I mean, you could make up all sorts of uh, perils that might happen. It's never going to happen. It. I. I only point out that they have the power. Yeah, if but you, you don't think it's actually going to happen, do you? Then, for God's sakes, have a net neutrality act. It specifies what they can do. I'd love Not to see one that. that. says they can do everything, and so anything you do is all right, but yeah, you really shouldn't just, just license websites. And if things. Nobody's going to license really websites, Jerry, but if, if the Congress could write a good net neutrality, I mean, you said Congress will overturn this. They will. It, Probably. And if they overturn it with a good net neutrality rule and say, FCC, here are the rules, uh, uh, would you be happy with that? Except that if they do it in the next two years, the president will veto it. I don't know that that's a given. I think President Obama knows he's on the hook for a net neutrality. He's campaigned on those grounds. He's made a very strong statement that he uh, wants to support it. You think he'd veto it? What? He would veto any act that changes the FCC's power right now, I think. He said he would, but we'll see. I want to see a very definite limit to what the FCC can make you do. Yeah, I mean, I've worked at radio for years where the FCC has a lot of power and sometimes uh, is not well loved because of their ability to fine uh, people for using bad words and other things. Um, and yet, FCC regulation of radio has not really been a problem. I think it's gone quite well, frankly. Um, but I don't... I certainly don't relish the notion they might regulate websites or regulate podcasts. So the government did really well making it by making Ma Bell. Hmm? Well, we could debate over we who did made get, Ma Bell. I think Ma we Bell got made Bell Ma Bell. out of Ma Bell. Now, that would be wonderful, but it's not likely to happen. I just don't think that the government allowed the te the telephones progress the way it could have been. I think if the government had been in charge of, of the uh, Internet in 1990, 
we wouldn't have the internet we have now. Well, that may That's be true. All. That may be true. Uh, they certainly screwed things up by creating these uh, duopolies. Although I believe they did it under pressure from the companies who said, we're not going to invest on infrastructure unless uh, you make sure we have a monopoly. So what would you like to see, Jerry? I'd like to see what we've got now. It's working so far. Okay. We're going to take a break. Actually, uh, yeah, let's take, let's, before we take a break, let's take a look at what happened this week on Twit. Previously on Twit. It's a water filter in the form factor of a straw, but we apparently have basin water here. Oh, my God. Tech News Tonight. The U.S. Federal Communications Commission today voted in favor of net neutrality in the United States. The eyes have it. The item is in the year leading up to today's vote, a record four million citizens sent in comments, most of whom were in favor of net neutrality. Security Now. The worst thing that Commodia has done, the password <laughs> that protects their private key that's in the Superfish software installed on Lenovo laptops and a hundred other software products is Commodia. <laughs> Twit. Friends don't let friends miss twit. Because this one took 50 hours and this one took about 25 hours. So if, if those were two get erased, I, I would be pretty upset. Oh, no. That got erased. <laughs> That's okay. Is he, is... No, it's not. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that video, if you're listening, you're going, what happened there? That was from Toy Fair. Uh, uh, Ohio Art it makes the Etch-A-Sketch. Had an Etch-A-Sketch artist there who would sometimes spend days <laughs> twiddling the knobs to do cityscapes and all sorts of things and dick asked him well what happens uh, if somebody shakes it he said oh don't worry we drill holes and we let all the aluminum filings fall out of the etch -a sketch so you could shake it all you want nothing will happen just turn that one over and you could see the holes he dick did and it erased the etch -a sketch yeah. there were holes but apparently they neglected to empty the aluminum filings out uh the guy wasn't too devastated he said oh well that was only about 10 hours of work i'd have been a little and by the way, we're sending Chad to the doctor after drinking Petaluma River water. We think he's going to be okay. He's had no ill effects so far. R.I.P. Chad. R.I.P. Chad. <laughs> he's got a new. He's got a new <laughs> slogan. Hey, does Mike Elgin have a week ahead? Let's take a look. Mike Elgin, our news director. What's coming up this week? Not much coming up this week except the biggest show of the year: Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, Spain. Unofficial events are already happening today, but the show officially kicks off tomorrow. I'll be streaming live coverage from the floor, so stay glued to the live.twit.tv site all week and watch Tech News Today every day at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1800 UTC. Back to you, Leo. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, we're going to have some great coverage. Miriam Jouar, as you saw, was our, is already there. Mike is there. Uh, lots. This has become one of the most interesting. I mean, you know, I think even to rival, not as big as CES, but at least with the with the announcements to rival CES in terms of the importance. It's now the mobile bigger every important. year, you know, bigger yeah. every year. And you get to go to Barcelona, so there's that. Can't beat that. <sighs> Love to be there right oh, now. Man. You yeah. notice I've I've got snacks. When 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 friends have a disagreement, the best solution is to break out snacks. I wish I could send you some of these, Jerry. <laughs> Do you like snacks? Yeah. Who doesn't like? Uh, well, what about garlic plantains or cherry vanilla? Granola. How about jalapeno cashews? These are the ones we've been eating. Sarah and I went through a whole bag of these yesterday. Strawberry Greek yogurt pretzels. Oh, they're so good. Now, this is all from a company called Nature Box. These are nutritionist approved. These are not, this is not the snack you're getting out of your snack machine at work. These are deliciously awesome snacks made with great ingredients. No artificial flavors, no artificial colors, no high fructose corn syrup, no trans fats, no artificial sweeteners, just good stuff. The tastes great. Sweet, savory, uh, uh, spicy. You get to choose. They have snacks that are vegan, if you wish, or gluten-free. You can choose for dietary needs. Um, I think you're going to love Nature Box. We've set it up so you can get a free trial. Five of their most popular snacks. Just pay two bucks in shipping when you go to naturebox.com slash twit. Naturebox.com slash twit. Jalapeno white cheddar popcorn, cashew power clusters, whole wheat raspberry figgy bars. The fun thing is they're always doing new stuff. So, like, I'd never had these strawberry yogurt pretzels before. These are good. Naturebox.com. I, I shouldn't eat it, but I, 
I want to eat it, but I shouldn't. Go ahead, do it, Leo. Do it, Leo. Get there. <laughs> Naturebox.com. It's hard to do an ad while you're eating. <laughs> Slash. Mmm. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty, that's really good. Jerry, well, let's get your address so because we can we'd like to send you some if you don't mind. I think you'd like these. What do I do? Nothing. We'll just get you. We'll get your. Uh, we'll get your address. Oh, okay. For on email and uh, and we'll send you a, a nature box. I like to oh, send them to our hosts. You. Have hmm? you ever gotten one? I was just I have looking not. up on just my steal your my stuff computer here. to see where nature box was. What <laughs> the heck? It They're down the road from you. Yeah. They're in L.A. No, hey. no, not. They're in San Carlos. They're up here. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Oh, uh, uh, see, I tried not to. Couldn't help it. Nope. They I tried do to not save you. Mm. Mm. They're good. Uh, moving on. You know, I, I, there's such a debate over the, the the FCC thing. We'll see what happens. I think you're right, Jerry, that the Congress will probably try to do something. We'll see what happens. Veri I liked Verizon's public policy blog, which emphasized as you did, that these rules came from 1934. <laughs> they published their response in Morse code, the dominant technology <laughs> of the era, I guess. Has anybody translated? Oh, yeah, they did. Snarky. That's snark. That's snark. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. What, el what else is in the news here real quickly? Um, oh, security. You saw Steve Gibson talk a little bit about uh, the Commodia virus. This broke last week. We talked about the fact that Lenovo had put adware on some of their laptop systems, the consumer-grade laptops, adware called Superfish. The adware uh, was bad enough, frankly, because what it did is watch everything you did on the Internet, use the Superfish technology to match images. So if you go to Amazon and you start looking at, uh, you know, uh, drones, and then put ads onto the Amazon web page, additional ads for competitors onto the Amazon web pages. Lenovo's defense was, we thought customers would like that. Uh, but worse uh, was the fact that Superfish didn't implement this very well. They, of course, wanted to crack into SSL streams. They couldn't see into those. So they uh, licensed a product called Commodia, K-O-M-O-D-I-A. Steve does a great dissection of this on uh, Security Now on uh, our Wednesday uh, episode a couple of days ago. But Commodia turns out, not only is it so badly written that it's a massive security flaw, but it's used by hundreds, literally, of other programs. How to Geek, which had done a great piece um, on uh, the download.com site, CBS. I'm sorry, Jason, CBS Interactive's download.com. Can you do anything about them? Uh no. No. Um <laughs> you're not gonna you I would recuse yourself at this point. From, I, would definitely recuse myself from that discussion. <laughs> uh, somebody, I keep I keep giving these guys a hard time. So uh, a couple of months ago, they did a great piece. Here's what happens when you install the top 10 apps on download.com. These are programs, download.com, kind of as a convenience to you, offers for download. All of them share where a freeware from other sources. But download.com wraps this software in their own delivery mechanism and uh after down so <laughs> how to geek says danger do not try this at home in fact they used they i think they used a virtual machine so they went there and they looked at the 10 most popular downloads avast avg km player yak c cleaner uh free youtube downloader driver booster you know some of it kind of junky but most of it pretty good they downloaded it all and they were, and by the way, and this is the key, agreed in every instance to accept the additional software that was wrapped around it. Uh, it was a mess. Browser hijacking software, adware, none of it technically viruses because all of it had an uninstall feature. In every case, you had to accept it. There was nothing sneaked on your machine, although one might say that some of this was a little surreptitious. Um, so they've done a follow-up on this. <laughs> and it turns out that two of these programs have Commodia in them. So now you're really screwed. So uh, Commodia is everywhere. What it does is break SSL. And by and it does so in about as brain-dead a way as you can do it. They, they do it with the same key for all machines. 
uh, and they have a, a, I think, a very difficult to deduce password, Komodia, K-O-M-O-D-I-A. So Download.com and others are are now bundling Superfish-style HTTPS breaking adware. Now can you do anything, Jason? Not a word. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get you in trouble with your bosses. It's not your fault. Tech Republic yeah. does not do this. No. Uh, yeah. And uh, just stop using download.com would be my best. Get, get, the, get the software from the original source. And uh, if you do, actually, apparently somebody's saying that Java, the Oracle download of Java, breaks HTTPS encryption. The LavaSoft Web Companion, which is... Supported by these offers, according to Oracle. Oh, dear. The LavaSoft Web Companion. You also get Results Bay, Chocolate Bar, and Slow PC Fighter. Holy cow. Um, just a mess. So while I was really uh, upset with Lenovo, I have to point out they're not the only ones. And uh, a lot of this stuff is all over the Internet. So stay away. The funny, funny thing about LavaSoft is they're the companies that make... Ad aware, the ad removal and blocking software, and they use Commodia. A lot of antiviruses apparently use Commodia. Yeah, it's bad news. I mean, yeah. it's, just, it's, bad, uh. it's bad news. And look, the best thing that we can say is that this came to light, and hopefully companies will change their practices when they've seen sort of the outrage and, and what's possible, um, <clears throat> you know, from this, uh, you know, across the board. Uh, well, Lenovo's because, feeling it for sure. In fact, this might be some of the good that's come out of it. They did say, we'll see if they do this, that they're not going to put any ad where on there. They say, we don't really make that much. We're going to stop bundling adware and trialware entirely. Good. That'd be a great thing. That'd be a great development. Wouldn't it? Microsoft yeah. tried to do this with the signature PCs, and nobody went along with it. It was There was very few companies. Vizio did. I don't know where you, if you can still, I don't think you can get a Vizio. I, I forgot they made PCs. That's yeah, right. it was a very brief, shining moment. So we'll see. We'll see. Google uh, has turned uh, an about face. This is kind of an interesting development. On Wednesday, we talked about this on Twig. Uh, Google had announced that they would ban adult content on Blogger, that if you had adult content, you would have to make your Blogger blog private. Um, they uh, changed their porn policy. This week, we announced a change to Blogger's porn policy. We've had a ton of feedback, a ton, ton of feedback, including in particular about the introduction of a retroactive change. Some people have had accounts for 10 plus years, but also on the negative impact on individuals who post sexually explicit content to express their identities. Uh, Jessica Pelagio, social projects, product support manager at Google. Blog owners should continue to mark any blogs containing sexual explicit content as adult so that they can be placed behind an adult content warning page, but we're not going to shut you down. The problem with this kind of thing is that who decides? You know, no, I, I like there's lots of people, you know, myself included, who don't necessarily want to, you know, look at uh, that kind of stuff or whatever. But the thing is, who decides and what do they ban? And right. that's where this is such a slippery slope and why, um, you know, if you believe in free speech and you believe that as part of a, um, a just society that, you know, you have to have, um, you have to have some freedom of expression, um, then, you know, you, you kind of, you have to question these kinds of things. You know, the great example is Facebook, you know, Facebook had this policy where, um, <clears throat> they were taking down and banning accounts or, or, you know, censoring accounts of, uh, women breastfeeding. But then they were leaving up all kinds of other, you know, um, sexually explicit stuff, right. right? So obviously they were making poor choices. And the problem is once you – it's a slippery slope once you decide, you know, that you're going to start um, banning because it's like – then the questions of who and what is where it, it gets to be a, a serious problem. And I don't trust Google to do it any more than I trust Facebook. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that this is – and, and Apple, the same thing. Like Apple's trying to have it um, in, in their own way uh, in the App Store as well. Um, they maybe do a little bit better job that don't things that don't make news. Um, but there are still things I've heard, uh, you know, behind the scenes where sort of weird things get banned for odd reasons. Right. So 
it's tough, right? And if you believe in, uh, you know, a free society, you know, has to have a measure of freedom of expression and freedom to be able to publish, you know, then then you kind of have to question these kinds of things. I actually got in a conversation, Jeff Jarvis did, and I, I was I was observing it uh, with a pornographer uh, on Twitter, and the pornographer said, actually, we we would welcome this move from Google. Um, really. We want to keep adult stuff, you know, in an adult place, maybe .xxx or whatever. And uh, we don't want people running across it. That makes it hard for us to do business. And frankly, a lot of the adult content on Blogger and Tumblr is stolen from us in the first place. So we would welcome kind of this decision from these companies to keep adult content off. We wouldn't welcome anybody who would say no adult content on the Internet, but let's put it somewhere that uh, kids aren't going to stumble on it. And then we don't get all the heat that we get. Huh. But I agree with you. I think it's, but what is pornography? What yeah. is erotica? What is an expression of uh, art? You know, Leonard Nimoy uh, was a well, great... I'll give you... Go ahead. I'll give you an example. Uh, you ban various things. Are you going to ban, say, uh, Boogie Nights? Where right, Julianne which is a work Moore of art, but sexy. a porn star. Right. And in fact, she is a porn star in that movie. Now, do you, is that an art movie, which it, most people say it is? Absolutely. Or is. is it just a way of hiding porn? Right. And who decides? Right. Very difficult to do so. I don't yes. think I want the FCC deciding. <laughs> they do decide yeah. on radio, don't they? They have those seven words. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to say Leonard Nimoy, who uh, later in his uh, life was had a very good career as a photographer, did a number of photography books. Uh, uh, one of his books was of uh, large women uh, nudes. Yeah. And uh, that certainly was not pornography, but might be banned under a policy like this. So I think Google did the right thing. They backed down. That reminds me of a Leonard Nimoy story that I meant to say earlier. When oh, we were yeah. Talking about sure. Leonard Nimoy. Since we're, since we're, since we're getting toward the end— um, one of the great things that came out, you know, he he was sort of notoriously, um, uh, I don't know, irascible, um, you know, not necessarily always the friendliest person to sort of be on set with and that kind of thing. But um, Roddenberry called him the conscience of, of Star Trek. Um, and I thought it was really, there was a really great story that came out um, about him, I thought, that would sort of be appropriate in, in sort of a week where we're remembering him, which was where, this was before he was a big star. When uh, Star Trek got started um, and he found out, you know, somehow, whatever people talk, you know, what the other stars were kind of making. Um, and he discovered that uh, Nichelle Nichols, you know, African-American woman. Uhuru. Was make Uhuru, yes. Uhuru. Was making considerably less than the others, even with similar credentials um, and, and all of that. And he was outraged by it and um, took it to uh, the studio and uh, spoke up about it and stood up for her and said that, you know, that it was wrong, even though he wasn't a big star. And, and basically that, you know, um, that he was going to, um, you know, he threatened them, you know, uh, at that point um, in terms of, and he, awesome. even though he was not the main star. And, uh, and it worked and, and got, you know, Nichelle Nichols. Awesome. Uh, she talks about it in the People magazine um, kind of thing. But I just think that's a great, that's a cool story to remember about somebody, you know, that, that passed away this week that meant a lot to a lot of people in the science and tech space. And, uh, you know, what a, what a cool thing for him to do and stand up and make a difference. And you it, see it, that I picture uh, from the uh, space station, one of the astronauts uh, yeah. uh, with the uh, live long and prosper sign over the, uh, going out the window in the world. I thought it was Over beautiful. Boston, which was uh, Logan oh, was Nimoy's yes. hometown. Oh, yeah. I didn't yes. notice that. That's neat. Perfect. Uh, uh, yes. Awesome. And by the way, the Persnickety chat room says it reminds me. It's Uhura. Uhura, it is. Not Uhura. Uhuru. I just mispronounced it. At least, you did, at least you didn't call it Star Wars, okay? So small Which victories. I do often. <laughs> but as right. uh, Leo. <laughs> Turn in your gift difference. card now. Okay, all right. One has Tauntauns. Yes. And Stormtroopers. Another has Tribbles. The other one has Tribbles and Vulcan Mind Melds. Mmm. Mmm. And Bitter Dregs. Bitter Dregs. Bitter Dregs. He wrote that, you know. I did not know that. Yeah. Well, it's not the Battle of Bilbo Baggins. It's not quite. It's close. <laughs> uh, we'll take a break. Come back with more. I want to hear, Jason, about your book. I know I'm in it, so it's a little self-serving, but I want to hear about that. I want to hear what Jerry Pornell's up to. 
Jason Snell, I want to hear about the growth of your fabulous podcast network. If only the FCC could do something about that. I must be stopped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that story about um, Uhuru, Miguel Barrett had some influence on that too. Of course, she became Mrs. Jean Roddenberry. Yeah, yep. She was the voice of every computer all the way until the latest Star Trek. She was, you know, she passed away recently, but she was still the voice of the computer in every uh, series up until, in every working, movie. Working, But she got involved in that pay controversy, too. Yeah, and That's and I presume Uhuru, Uhura got her uh, pay raise. She did. She did eventually get her pay equity, which is brilliant. Nice. Is wonderful. This episode of Twit brought to you by our great friends at Squarespace. My daughter just started her Squarespace site. I'm really proud of her. She had an idea for a website she wanted to create with a friend uh, as a public service. It was going to be a blog. And I told her all the choices. I said, you know, you can get it for free. And But she independently, I don't even think she knew that we love Squarespace or they're a sponsor or we use them independently came up with Squarespace. She said, Dad, I, I know it's $8 a month, but is it okay? And I said, yes, it is okay. Squarespace, they wanted a site that would look great, be responsive, they could take donations, and Squarespace can do it. I love Squarespace. And by the way, it's the best hosting ever, never goes down. The best support ever, live chat and email support 24-7 from the Squarespace offices in New York. It is affordable, $8 a month, and with that's all the hosting plus the great software and when you register for a year you even get the domain name all squarespace sites are something uh really important nowadays responsive used to be remember you'd have a mobile site and a desktop site well now everybody's on mobile screen sizes are all over the place responsive is the way one site fits all and squarespace sites do it they scale to look great on any de device when you upload an image Nine thumbnails are made so that you automatically have the right uh, size for the right device. It's so great. Every Squarespace site comes with a free online store. And and by the way, the e-commerce solution on Squarespace, $24 a month and you get everything, including ShipStation, really is nice. Cover pages, something new on Squarespace 7 lets you set up a beautiful one-page online presence in minutes. So you can create a landing page for your brand, your personal identity to promote a product. Squarespace has great apps on the iPhone and iPad and Android devices. In fact, if you're a photographer, I, I think there's really no better place for you to go to put your portfolio because not only does it, are you going to get a great portfolio style to look like your style, to, to fit your uh, aesthetic, but you also get a great portfolio app on the iPad that'll actually pull the images from your site so you can show them to clients. That's all part of Squarespace. I want you to try it. One of the nicest things about Squarespace is you can go to squarespace.com, click the Get Started button, and with no credit card, no information, basically an email address, a password, and a name for the site, you've got two weeks to create a site. You can import content from your old site. You can really play with all the templates. And, of course, the content is completely separate from the template, so you can try them all, see how your stuff looks, customize your little heart out. Only thing I ask when you decide you want to sign up, and I wish Abby knew this, Make sure you use the offer code TWIT. You'll get 10% off your purchase. Uh, I think she just signed up without doing that. But that's okay, Abby. That's okay. I'm happy you're using Squarespace. We want to thank Squarespace for their support of This Week in Tech. Square, Squarespace. Build it beautiful. That's what Jeff Bridges did. If you haven't visited his dream site yet, it's, it's, it's exactly what you'd expect from the dude. Squarespace.com. Use the offer code TWIT. Still kind of trying to figure out uh, the deal with Jamalto. Jamalto, which makes 2 billion SIM cards a year, is used by most of the uh, mobile companies in the world, including, I think, all the U.S. mobile companies, uh, was uh, in, in, in the most recent Snowden leaks implicated. Uh, was it, I think it was a Snowden leak that they said Jamalto had been hacked by the NSA and had all of the encryption keys for the SIM cards and was able, therefore, to spy on anybody using a phone with a Jamalto SIM card. Jamalto um, said, whoa, <laughs> hold on there, wait a minute. Did an investigation, and they did, in fact, say, we detected attacks in 2010 and 2011 
gives us reasonable grounds to believe an operation by the NSA and GCHQ, the British spy agency, probably happened. But they reassured everybody the attacks against Jamalto only breached its office networks and could not have resulted in a massive theft of SIM encryption keys. The operation aimed to intercept the encryption keys as they were exchanged between mobile operators and their suppliers globally. By 2010, we had widely deployed, already widely deployed, a secure transfer system. And only rare exceptions to this scheme could have led to the theft. So basically, they say, none of our products were impacted. Uh, in the case of an eventual key theft, the intelligence services would only be able to spy on communications on second generation 2G mobile networks. 3G and 4G networks are not vulnerable. So uh, believe what you want. But Jamalto says, didn't happen. And if it did, don't worry. Unless you're on a 2G network. Anything else? Oh, we talked about Snapchat a couple of weeks ago with Baratunde and Nick Bilton. Nick's real high on this. This would, yeah. The Snapchat Hour Stories had just launched. Uh, and uh, I actually set up an account and started putting up stories till I realized they're deleted in 24 hours. That's a lot of work for nothing. Uh, but big brands got involved, including uh, Yahoo. Katie Kirk does a daily newscast on Snapchat. Yes, she does. ESPN, many channels. And apparently these uh, stories are generating... A lot of views. Tech Republic has one. Do you? You do it? Yep, yep. We sure do. Uh, we do stuff on there. Okay, so are you part of the Discover thing? Like the, 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 no. The, no, that must cost a lot of money to get that. Well, that's they they did that for a limited number of partners. Big partners. Um, yeah. and, and big partners. Right. And you can tell, it's funny, when I look at Discover, when I open that thing up, um, I hear the voices of, of, a, of a venture capitalist in the background saying, hey, <laughs> if what, only... if we, what if we got some big brands and then we got them to produce these short clips about the same uh, you know, piece like Snapchat and we put those in their own little section on the site? I mean, it totally reeks of that kind of thing because yeah. it's so different than the actual experience of what Snapchat is, that Discover feature. And actually, some of it's kind of compelling um, and the, I actually you know, the enjoy the Katie that. Couric bit. Uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. you can swipe through the newscast, which is kind of interesting. It really is kind of interesting and fun and, and innovative, but it's so different than what Snapchat right. is really sort of about, you know? So you got to um, think all the teenagers who use Snapchat are kind of like, what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> teenagers, uh, you know, now because Snapchat's doing the Discover thing and they're sort of getting bigger, you know, um, uh, Teenagers are like, okay, Snapchat's dead. Like all the, it's kind of like Facebook. Like now all the adults are coming in and like sending them friend requests and stuff. And they're like, okay, that's it. It's over. Um, I've heard that multiple times yeah. over the past couple weeks. Yeah. Teenagers so, will move on if they think mom and dad are uh, Rousey yeah. won in 14 seconds. Well, I'd be pissed if I did the pay-per-view on that. <laughs> yeah, it was super uh, quick. It was like literally out of the gate. Boom, done. Was that the big fight or was that, that was, a small That was one? the main event. That yeah. was the main event? Yeah. yeah. It's like Probably the Mike Tyson UFC. days. Yeah, yeah, Mike Tyson, Tyson did Michael that too, Spence. right? Yeah. Mike yes. Tyson used to. How much knock was the pay per view? 100 bucks? I don't know. I went to a friend's house to watch. Did it. you? Yeah. They had a party. Gina Trapani did too. She loves USC. So this <laughs> is. A, I think this is a good use of it. So this is an ESPN headline app. And just like Snapchat, you swipe and you get the next story. I'm sorry. It's loading slowly here. I don't know if that's our network. Or, I think Snapchat does a lot of caching. And because I never use it, it's taking its time. But you get the, you get a sense of, of what this can do. This is the ESPN channel, and these are only live for twenty four hours. So what is uh, what does Tech Republic do? Yeah, we do more like behind the scenes kind of stuff, like talking that. about stories that we're doing, talking about things that are going. On. You know, we kind of have some humor, do some stuff in the newsroom. Yeah. The handle's just the username's just at Tech Republic. Um, you know, it's uh, it's just kind of some fun stuff, and we do it in stories. Uh, and you know, we we try to you know, be a little bit, uh, a little bit humorous and, uh, you know, lighthearted. A lot of our content's pretty intense stuff about, you know, um, you know, keeping the world running and, right. and make right. good decisions about technology and all of that. So, uh, so yeah, we try to do it in the spirit of, of a lot of the stuff that's already on Snapchat, not really around the sort of discover stuff. Right. Uh, this is the, uh, Katie Couric Yahoo news and she, she narrates it. They must, have some yeah, tool for the Discover folks because this is obviously not produced oh, in Snapchat. Yeah. 
it's a separate CMS. Yeah. They have a CMS that nobody else has because you know Snapchat yeah. everything else. You have to do it live. You take a yeah. video, it's got to be live. Yeah, this you take is a photo, it's got to be live. You can't import photos. You can't import videos. Everything has to be you know filmed or snapped from the app itself, and that's part of you know the immediacy of of that platform. But yeah, these folks are obviously shooting professional videos yeah. and uploading them and building them in some kind of CMS that nobody else has access to. Hey, hey, Jerry, what's your what's your Snapchat handle? I want to add you. <laughs> What's this now? Never mind. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. And Jason's yours is Tech Republic? Yeah, Tech Republic. Uh just is the username. All right. So I'm gonna search and I should find you. Yeah, my net is down. In fact, I even got the sad ghost, which I've never seen before. Oh. Snapchat has a sad ghost mm -hmm. if your internet is uh, too slow. But That's Phil, not me, by Phil the way. Ghost. That's my staff member is much more much more fun and funnier than I am. Well, so, uh, let me tell you, this is, according to uh, Snapchat, uh, some of these, like this, uh, our story, the Snowmageddon story, 25 million views. Users took screenshots 5,000 times. Um, many of these views as high as, uh, in the millions, at some as high as 27 million. So uh, the Oscars, uh, which averaged 36 million people last week, are, are they're, the Snapchat folks are coming in strong. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Yes, same for ours. We were pushing 27 million last week, too. No, you're not. <laughs> you lie. <laughs> not I don't know point. who First Barrel is, but they have 20. Po so you can actually see the views uh, on here. 20.3 yeah. million views. Holy camoly. That is, that is kind of uh, mind-boggling. That also explains why Snapchat is now... <laughs> Uh, valued at what uh, twenty billion? Some huge number. It demonstrates something I've been trying to say for some time. There are lots of niches out there. Some are big, some are little, but it doesn't take a very big niche to support you. Yep. I don't have any twenty million readers, but I have enough that they buy. Five, six hundred books a month. Yeah, nor do we, but uh, you're right. We can make a decent living. Jerry, what are you working on now? You said two books? <clears throat> yes. I am got to an age, and so sort of has Larry, that we do plots and rewrites, and somebody else does all the work of writing the book, but oh. what the heck. Yeah, that's what I do. It makes for a good book, actually, because the plots are good. Right. And the writing and, uh, is it's cra good craftsmanship. We somebody who knows what he's doing yeah. to be the writer. Yeah. Steve Barnes is very good. What are the, what are the stories about? Well, the one with Niven, we're writing a sequel to the Beowulf children's story. Oh, good. The first interstellar con uh, colony in a faster, in a slower than light universe. So what happens after about four generations and the equipment you brought with you wore out? And uh, it'll be pretty good, especially since there are some very interesting aliens in our uh, book. The um, other one, you haven't <laughs> got interstellar travel yet. We've just got asteroid colonies. And there's a 12-year-old girl whose father has invented a, a little better spaceship and the government wants it. And it will be an interesting story as to what she does. You know, it's funny you say there are interesting aliens in your book because Jason Heyer has some interesting aliens in his book as well. <laughs> He's doing a great book called Follow the Geeks, which is being released online chapter by uh, chapter. Chapter one was Baratunde, right? Baratunde Thurston, yes. Chapter one was Is amazing. that gone now? It is. And so we only we released them. The book will be released later this year. Um, you know, we haven't released the, the the people that are in it is kind of the the fun part. You know, we kind of released them, you know, a few weeks before or a few days before. Actually, we we uh, we announced them before we released the chapter. Yeah. And as we release the chapter, when we announce the chapter and we release a chapter, we take the previous chapter down. Oh. And so it gives you a chance to uh, to read it. We leave it up for a few weeks until the next chapter um, and, you know, uh, a, a few weeks to a month until the next chapter uh, is available. Nice. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not just me. I have a co-author, um, Lindsay Gilpin. Um, we're co-writing it. 
And uh, it's been it's one of the the coolest, funnest um, things that I've ever done. And so I'm enjoying it a lot, enjoying the idea of trying to release a book and, and you know, really take advantage of the power of the Internet. Because one of the things that we're doing when we release these chapters is we're asking people's feedback. You know, what did you relate to in this story? What was the part that you thought was most significant cool. in their um, story? What were the most important insights um, from their life, from their story that, you know, you think um, will influence the future of, uh, of tech, of society, um, you know, of business. And then we're going to take the best comments, the best stuff. And when we release the final version of the book, we're going to put the, we're going to publish um, the best comments at the end of each chapter. And so people have a chance to have their voice uh, included in the book as well. That is really neat. So the good news uh, for, uh, uh, fans of the Twit Network is Baratunde Thurston's Chapter One, Chapter Two, Lisa Betney, mostly Lisa. Lisa Betney, yes, we uh, love Lisa. She's amazing. What do I do? Uh, Google Follow the Geeks. Yeah, it's Follow the Geeks. Uh, yeah. bo follow the Geeks Book dot com. Jerry is the is the site, and then Twit on Twitter. It's just at Follow the Geeks. Yeah. So Lisa's chapters up. Lisa's chapters up. That just went up last week. Um, so that will be up. Uh, you know, a little while longer. Uh, it's a great read. You know, her story is amazing. I think what a lot of people didn't realize is, you know, what a, uh, you know, what a tumultuous story she had. So many challenges and ad so much adversity she had to overcome yeah. um, at different parts of her life. And uh, that really uh, was something that we talk a lot about in the chapter. And she was great. She was really open about it and, um, uh, you know, just gave us some some great um, material uh, from her life. And uh, it was a lot of fun. She's a, she's an amazing person. Very inspiring person. Same thing with Baratunde. So inspiring. Lots of uh, adversity he's overcome as well. And they both came or, you know, used those things to do very unique, um, very innovative things. They were both out front of a lot of trends um, and setting trends. And that's a lot of what we, we end up getting to uh, in each of their stories and each of their chapters. We, yeah. we adore Lisa uh, Batney, and she's done very well. Uh, moved back, I think, to uh, uh, Vancouver, right? Yeah, Victoria. Victoria, right. Much, what, much prettier. What is the logic of taking the first chapter down? Uh, after we've put them up. So the idea is we want each one to kind of be, you know, special. We want to focus all the attention on one chapter at a time um, and have people and also, you oh. know, have there to be some urgency to read it for that period that that it's up. Um, Are you, you sure know, that, that's wise? Uh, no. I <laughs> would... No, that's, Myself yeah. think that is not wise. If somebody sees there's a fourth chapter, they'd never heard of it before, but they can't get the first three chapters. Yeah, well, well, what the is the incentive for reading the fourth? For re well, they'll each each of the stories. The reason, Jerry, I, I I was kidding when I said no. You know, the idea we have thought this through a lot. I mean, the idea is each chapter does stand alone. Um, each chapter is the story of one innovator and their story you know, in particular. And so our hope is that you get to chapter four and you read chapter four and you say, this is amazing. I'd like to read more of this, that they'll, you know, pre-order the, the final book and say, okay, I want to read the rest of these stories. And, but one of the things that, you know, we've done is, you know, in nonfiction, you, you typically take a year to research a book and then you write, um, you know, that book. And so by the time you get to, you know, that you're, you're two years removed from when you, you know, originally started this thing. And when the book publishes, and a lot has happened and changed in their life. And so, you know, our thought is to release these as we go, um, then, you know, the, the information that we have in them is very current, is very up to date. And um, well, you know, so I, I can see publishing them chapter at a time. I don't see taking them away. Taking them down? I think a little I mean, urgency is not a bad thing. Yeah. means you got to go read it. I put off reading Baratunde's story, and now I'm kicking myself. <laughs> so I, I think that's, you know, it's not a bad thing to create a little scarcity, Jerry. You know that. Um, you can't create scarcity. <laughs> I just copy the thing off and read it when I feel well, like it. Well, if anybody it. has a you copy can't. of the Baratunde chapter. <laughs> 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 no, I'm going to have to buy the book. More chapters to come. Who else are you interviewing for uh, Follow the Geeks? Well, the, so the interesting thing is we haven't said, you know, one of the cool things about serial publishing one of the interesting things about publishing that way, and we saw this with the serial podcast, is it's a cliffhanger, right? You, right? you can't wait to see sort of what happens next. And so what we've done is we haven't said who 
who's actually uh, going to be next. And that's part of the fun is creating a little bit of that interest and urgency. And then we don't really announce it until a couple of days before we're going to release the chapter. And then we say, cool. you know, next is going to be chapter three will be dot, 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 you know, and then we'll, we'll say, how are you is. doing with it? You know, the great thing is we've gotten so much. Uh, we also did a little bit of a crowdfunding campaign to kind of um, get it started because we're self publishing it. Um, and, uh, to, to sort of cover the cost of printing, um, and, you know, we're, we're going to do an audio book. So, you know, cover the cost of being able to hire somebody to do the audio book, um, and those kinds of things. So the crowdfunding campaign did great. We got the money that we needed to, uh, to do those kinds of things. Um, and then we've gotten so much amazing, um, uh, feedback, um, from people that, uh, the, the one thing that I didn't expect was how many people honed in on this idea of doing a book in a new way. And how many people were excited about this idea of of innovating on the idea of how to do a book, uh, you know, to take advantage of the power of the web, both for you know drawing feedback and crowdfunding, and then also you know releasing it um, serially, you know, on our site um, to to sort of generate uh, interest and in, in immediate uh, give give people some immediate um, access to the information. So that's the stuff that people have honed in on and have really been excited about much more than I expected. I didn't know, you know, this idea is, is books have been done the way they've been done, you know, since Gutenberg. Um, and to do it a little differently is, is kind of a foreign idea. And I've been surprised how many people were excited about that. And that's one of the well, cool things about uh, the internet is the uh, chance to experiment, Jerry. And you know, this, you don't know what's going to work. It's a whole new world. Yeah. And so try stuff and see what happens. Well, it's an interesting pattern. We just change the rules of the science fiction writers of America to allow self-published writers Good. to join the organization. Good. It took three years of debating over it because it you really don't it's not a fan organization and we do you're not interested in in having the members of people who would like to be writers but aren't yet. So it took a long time for them to come up with it, but they came up with something that might work. We'll see. Now I suspect that you're going to end up with more self-published writers than you are with with traditional published writers and members. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Agree. Yeah. Actually, this is not uh, completely novel. I, I didn't know this. The chat room tells me that William Gibson mm -hmm. did a book in uh, the early 90s called Agrippa that disappeared as you read it. So... If you read the digital version, it would encrypt each page after uh, reading it. If you read the physical version, the pages were treated with photosensitive chemicals. So as you read it, the words would fade yeah. and Some, disappear. Somebody took pictures of all the uh, pages and OCR'd it and posted it to the internet. I read it that way. <laughs> you can so, still read it. Uh, you know. It's not gone forever. <laughs> but it, it, did, it lasted, longer, uh, uh, lasted longer than a Rousey fight, but not much. Yeah, there's one. See, in, I'm timely. I got the timely reference there, in there. There's one right? in a uh, in a. Uh, Is it Ruzi? One of the archives in in the UK has a copy of it that's unread that they keep under oh, that's lock nice. and key as like the permanent because and you can't read it because it'll disappear. Wow, that's cool. What are you up to, Jason Snell? Uh, you know, uh, sixcolors.com, writing about Apple and other stuff, and uh, lots of podcasts at theincomparable.com. That's where you can find me cool. most of the time these cool. days. We love what you're doing. Keep up the Thank good you. work. Got some new shows coming, so check it out. Chatroom also gave me this you, link. Leo. Dwarf. <laughs> yeah, I know you are, but that's okay because the FCC is going to protect me. Yes. <laughs> dwarf Bright Light on the Dwarf Planet of Series. What is going on? This is from CNET. Jason, you know anything about this? The latest images from NASA's Dawn spacecraft reveal a second mysterious bright spot. Could be campers. <laughs> yeah, could be. Could be. This is the yeah, planet. This is the planet that uh, is this in the where is this is in the Kuiper Belt where is this planet? Oh Ceres? no, Ceres is the largest asteroid. asteroid. Oh, it's an asteroid. Oh, it's yeah. in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It's the largest of the asteroids. Yeah, so it's not a dwarf planet. It's just a no, it giant asteroid. It is a dwarf well, planet because it's, it's there, round. And, nowadays, yeah. there's a movement to call it a a uh, a minor a minor planet rather than an asteroid, just as Pluto. But went right. was downgraded to trying to upgrade series. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you think that white spot is, Jerry? I have no idea. I think it's an artifact myself. Mm, that's what I would guess, too. Yeah. Some J.J. Abrams lens flare. <laughs> a, little, a little lens flare. <laughs> a reflection off an ice cap. All right. Well, we'll leave you with that mystery. Mm. 
Thank you, Jerry Pornell. I am so glad uh, you're feeling wait better. Wait a minute. You haven't shown my website. Oh, well, this that, we can't. This is my pledge week. <laughs> is it pledge? You're, you do pledge week? This is the end of the pledge week today. Well, now, or it's now or never. Go to Jerry oh, Pornell. not really. Go to <laughs> Jerry Pornell. Shh, Jerry, I'm trying to help you here. Go to jerrypornell.com. And uh, where can I pledge? Go up to the top. This is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> you see the way it says, um, the view mail? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. It drives me crazy sometimes <laughs> the way they have set this up for me. Uh, I love it. Well, you, you can, can get there eventually. You should definitely support Jerry. There's a PayPal button right there on the front page at jerrypornell.com. Does it give you access to more material? Oh, you get, that's a daily thing. It's, you just haven't got it. I don't know what happened. Chaos Manor, try. Chaos Manor. Try W to, I don't know. <laughs> me nuts. The web, it's not easy, let me tell you. Here's the Chaos Manor uh, reviews. Well. Cut short a little bit by uh, Ill Health. You going to start writing those again soon? I'm, oh, I've been doing, there are, to, I've got something up today for heaven's sake. Oh, see, I need to become a subscriber. Yes, you do. Oh, Jerry, I'm sorry. Here we go. Last chance. It's the public radio model. Three grades of subscription. Yeah. Regular, 20 bucks. Patron, 36 bucks. Platinum, $100. And you can do it right there. Yeah, you're right. It is kind of hard to find the pay me some money. JerryPornell.com slash paying that first dot HTML. Link on there. I don't the know. The very first link, right in that, where it says the first link you see on there. Yeah, that takes me to Chaos Manor. There Pledge you go. week. Last chance. I'm not after eating and money, says Jerry. Sweat to my <laughs> several and there you go. People. That's great. Jerry, such a pleasure. I, I, I always love having you on. We're so glad you're doing better. You're doing great. Feisty as usual. Take care, Jerry. Thank you, Jason Snell, sixcolors.com. Pleasure to be here as always. Got to do it. Got to read Thank it. You. Come back a week. Oh, no, you're going to be uh, busy. We'll talk after sometime. <laughs> Come back a week from, oh, no, you got an invite, didn't you? Maybe for Mac Break Weekly. We'll see. Yeah, you could do it Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Serenity will be there. Nice. Say hi to her. Uh, thank you also, Jason Heiner. Congratulations on uh, the the book. It's I'm so glad it's uh, it's doing great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Look you. forward to future pleasure. chapters. If they're all twit hosts, though, I'm going to be a little suspicious. Mm. Mm. All I can say is we have some amazing digital innovators to come. Still and to you'll come. Know many of them. Yes. Many of them. Uh, thank you for joining us. We had a great live studio audience. Thank yourself for being here. We're really happy to have you. Tickets at twit.tv. If you come early, you get a nice chair. If you come later, you get a kind of uncomfortable chair. But we promise a chair for you if you send us an email. Tickets at twit.tv. Uh, you can also watch live. We love it if you do. We're on 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 2300 UTC, Sunday afternoon, evening. And uh, if you're live, you can join us in the chat room and as you see, we use the chat room quite a bit. They're really a great resource. We thank you, chat room, for being here and our community all around. If you can't watch live on-demand versions, audio and video, always available after the fact for all our shows at our website, soon to be remodeled, twit.tv. We're in the middle of that right now. That's why I have all the dust in my hair. Uh, or uh, iTunes or wherever you get your, uh, your, uh, your pre-recorded digital content. All the same places The Incomparable is. Yeah, that's right. Ask for it by name <laughs> until the FCC steps in. Till I get till I can get my podcasting license, I'll just have to follow in your footsteps. Uh, but uh, we also have great Twit apps, thanks to uh, our developers, Mark Hansen and Craig uh, Mullaney and uh, Dimitri Lialin on all the platforms: Windows, iOS, yes, Windows Phone, yes, iOS, Android, even Roku. Craig did that great job on that. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. Another Twit this is in the can. Yeah. Yeah. Doing the twit, baby. Doing the twit, baby. Doing the twit, baby. Doing the twit, baby.